رحبوا معي بمندوب جلالة الملك المعظم دولة الدكتور بشر الخصاونة رئيس الوزراء الأفخم Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our keynote speaker and guest of honor, His Excellency Dr. Bashir al Kasoni, the Prime Minister and representative of His Majesty King Abdullah II. Guest speaker, Dr. Rusio Aguilar Montoya, the Governor of the Central Bank of Jordan, the AFI Board Chair and AFI Board Directors, the AFI Executive Director, governors, heads of institutions, industry leaders, senior executives and representatives of respective governments and financial institutions, delegates of the 2022 AFI Global Policy Forum present here and to all those tuning in via our social media platforms from across the world. Assalamu alaikum and warm greetings from the home of the Rose Red City, one of more than 100,000 archaeological, religious, and tourist sites. It is such a privilege to be here today. Ladies and gentlemen, we begin with the official welcome, and to deliver this, I now call upon His Excellency, Dr. Adele Arshakas, the governor of the Central Bank of Jordan. Let's give him a round of applause. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم مندوب جلالة الملك عبد الله الثاني ابن الحسين حفظه الله دولة رئيس الوزراء الدكتور بشر الخصاونة سعادة المدير التنفيذي لتحالف الشمول المالي الدكتور ألفريد هانغ أصحاب المعالي والعطوفة الضيوف الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يسعدني في هذا الصباح الجميل أن أرحب بكم جميعا في افتتاح منتدى السياسات العالمي لتحالف الشمول المالي لعام 2022 الذي يعقد تحت الرعاية الملكية السامية بحضور دولة رئيس الوزراء الدكتور بشر الخصاونة مندوبا عن جلالة الملك عبد الله الثاني بن الحسين حفظه الله وأود أن أنتهز هذه الفرصة لترحيب بضيوفنا الأعزاء من خارج المملكة متمنيا لهم طيب الإقامة في الأردن أرض التراث والحضارة والكرم والضيافة إنه لأمر سار أن يأتي هذا المنتدى الذي ينظمه البنك المركزي الأردني 
بالتعاون مع التحالف العالمي للشمول المالي آفي وجاهيا بعد عودة الحياة لطبيعتها في عقائب جائحة كورونا وما رافقها من تداعيات أثرت خلال العامين الماضيين على مختلف نواحي حياتنا وغيرت من طريقة تواصلنا إلا أنه ورغم كل تداعياتها السلبية تمكنت من تسليط المزيد من الضوء على أهمية الشمول المالي في جميع أنحاء العالم دولة رئيس الوزراء السيدات والسادة والحضور الكرام يمضي الأردن قدماً بتنفيذ العديد من الإصلاحات المالية والاقتصادية الهادفة إلى تحقيق النمو الاقتصادي الشامل والمستدام حيث استمرت مسيرة الإصلاح حتى خلال جائحة كورونا وتمكنت الحكومة لغاية الآن من استكمال أربع مراجعات بنجاح ضمن برنامج الإصلاح الاقتصادي 2020 إلى 2024 بالتعاون مع صندوق النقد الدولي في الوقت المحدد لها رغم الظروف غير المواتية وهو ما يؤكد الثقة بالاقتصاد الأردني وقد أسهمت هذه الإصلاحات بترسيخ ثقة المجتمع الدولي بالأردن وتسهيل الوصول إلى الأسواق المالية الدولية بأسعار فائدة منافسة وبنسب تغطية مرتفعة ومما يعزز من قوة اقتصادنا الوطني نجاح البنك المركزي الأردني بالمحافظة على الاستقرار النقدي والمالي في المملكة ووجود جهاز مصرفي سليم ومتين يتمتع بالمنع والمرونة والقدرة على مواجهة الصدمات بفضل امتثاله للسياسات المصرفية والرقابية التي ينتجها البنك المركزي وتطبيق الأدوات الاحترازية الكلية المنسجمة مع أفضل الممارسات الدولية هذا إلى جانب تمتع الجهاز المصرفي بإدارات حصيفة وكفاءات مصرفية متميزة وتشير مؤشرات المتانة المالية التي صدرت للتو عن النصف الأول من عام 2022 إلى انخفاض نسبة الديون الغير عاملة إلى إجمالي الديون لتبلغ 4.6% فقط مقارنة مع 5% في نهاية عام 2021 إن التزام الحكومة بالإصلاحات الهيكلية واتخاذ الإجراءات المناسبة مكن الأردن من مواجهة التحديات المختلفة خاصة تلك التي نجمت عن جائحة كورونا بكفاءة واقتدار حيث تظهر العديد من المؤشرات الاقتصادية الكلية اليوم أداء إيجابيا لا سيما ما يرتبط منها بالقطاع الخارجي وخص بالذكر الدخل السياحي الذي يتعافى بشكل يفوق التوقعات محققا النمو بلغت نسبته 204.5% خلال الشهور السبع الأولى من العام الحالي كما واصلت الصادرات الوطنية تحسنها إذ نمت بنسبة 43.4% بالعشرة خلال النصف الأول من عام 2022 وقد ساهم كل ذلك في المحافظة على مستوى مريح من احتياطيات البنك المركزي من العملات الأجنبية لتبلغ حالياً 16.5 مليار دولار 16.5 مليار دولار وهو مستوى يكفي لتغذية 8.6 بالعشرة أشهر من مسردات المملكة من السلع والخدمات دولة رئيس الوزراء السيدات والسادة الحضور الكرام لقد أصبح الشمول المالي كما تعلمون محل اهتمام متزايد من قبل صانعي السياسات الاقتصادية نظرا لأهميته المرتبطة بتحقيق النمو الاقتصادي الشامل والمستدام وخلق فرص العمل وذلك من خلال حشد الموارد لتعزيز الادخار وزيادة معدلات الاستثمار دولة رئيس الوزراء السيدات والسادة الحضور الكرام لقد أدرك البنك المركزي الأردني في مرحلة مبكرة للغاية أهمية الشمول المالي في تحفيز النمو الاقتصادي وذلك إيمانا منه بإتاحة وصول الأفراد إلى مجموعة واسعة من الخدمات المالية بناء على دخلهم وتفضيلاتهم بطريقة آمنة وبأسعار مقبولة سيساعدهم بكل تأكيد على تحقيق احتياجاتهم والحفاظ على حياة أفضل لهم وانطلاقا من ذلك قام البنك المركزي الأردني في كانون أول 2017 بإطلاق الاستراتيجية الوطنية للشمول المالي 2018 إلى 2020 كأول دولة في المنطقة حيث كانت هذه الخطوة ضرورة نحو تحسين الشمول المالي للأفراد والشركات في المملكة تماشيا 
مع أهداف التنمية المستدامة التي وضعت من قبل منظمة الأمم المتحدة وقد حققت الاستراتيجية أهدافها حيث ارتفعت نسبة الشمول المالي إلى ما يقارب 3.41% وتقلصت الفجوة الجندرية إلى 22% وفي الوقت نفسه نجح الأردن في تحقيق قفزة في مؤشر الحصول على الائتمان ليحتل المرتبة الرابعة عالمياً وفقاً لتقرير ممارسة أنشطة الأعمال 2020 الصادر عن البنك الدولي بعدما كنا نحتل المرتبة 134 في عام 2019 وللبناء على هذه الإنجازات يعمل البنك المركزي الأردني حالياً على تطوير استراتيجية وطنية جديدة للاجتمال المالي 2023-2025 والتي سيكون لها نطاق أوسع يشمل جميع السكان ولا سيما المستبعدين من الخدمات المالية والنساء والشباب واللاجئين والشركات متناهية الصغر والصغيرة والمتوسطة وستركز هذه الاستراتيجية على مجموعة من السياسات والممكنات ذات الأولوية والتي من شأنها تعزيز الاستخدام المسؤول والمستدام والشامل للخدمات المالية بما في ذلك خدمات الائتمان والدفع والتحويل والادخار والتأمين باعتبارها ركائز ركائز أساسية تدعمها ممكنات متعددة المجالات لتعزيز الشمول المالي علاوة على ذلك يعمل البنك المركزي الأردني حالياً وبشكل وثيق مع كافة شركاء من القطاعين العام والخاص على إطلاق استراتيجية وطنية للمدفوعات للسنوات الثلاث القادمة 2023-2025 تهدف إلى وضع سياسات واضحة تكون كفيلة بدعم وتحفيز الإقبال على استخدام المدفوعات الرقمية في المملكة مع معالجة كافة التحديات المتعلقة بها كما يقوم البنك المركزي الأردني بتطوير استراتيجية التمويل الأخضر بالتعاون مع البنك الدولي وعدد من الشركاء ذو العلاقة دولة رئيس الوزراء السيدات والحضور الكرام قبل أن أختتم كلمتي أود أن أعرب عن عظيم شكري وامتناني لجلالة الملك عبد الله الثاني ابن الحسين حفظه الله على تشريف المنتدى برعايته الملكية السامية ولمندوب جلالة الملك دولة رئيس الوزراء الدكتور بشر الخصاونة على تواجده معنا اليوم كما أود أن أعرب على خالص شكري وتقديري للتحالف العالمي للشمول المالي آفي والقائمين عليه على دعمهم وجهودهم المستمرة في العمل على تحسين مستويات الشمول المالي متمنياً للجميع مناقشات مثمرة وللضيوف إقامة سعيدة في الأردن والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Ladies and gentlemen, please, another big round of applause for the Governor of the Central Bank of Jordan. We thank you sincerely, Your Excellency, for those very warm words of welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for the first of our opening remarks, and we welcome on stage Dr. Jesus de la Fuente Rodriguez, President Comisión Nacional Bancaria e de la Valores, excuse me, Mexico, CNBV, and AFI board chair to make his way forward for his opening remarks. Muy buenos días, Su Excelencia. Señor Primer Ministro de Jordania, Doctor Bicher al Casawen, Doctor Adel al Charcas, Gobernador del Banco Central de Jordania, Doctor Alfred Hani, Director Ejecutivo de la Alianza para la Inclusión Financiera, Doctora Rocía Aguilar Montoya, Superintendente General de Entidades Financieras de Costa Rica, 
miembros de la Junta Directiva y colegas distinguidos de AFI. Es un honor para, ir, para mí dirigirme a todos ustedes el día de hoy. Me siento muy honrado de estar por primera ocasión de manera presencial en un evento de AFI. Aún más después de que se hubiera pospuesto el foro en el 2020 para minimizar los riesgos involucrados del brote de COVID-19. Hoy, dos años después, estamos aquí disfrutando en este hermoso país este magno evento que han organizado en conjunto el Banco Central de Jordania y la Alianza para la Inclusión Financiera. Me da mucho gusto compartirles que México ha estado comprometido con AFI desde su fundación en 2008. En el 2011, nuestro país fue sede del Foro de Política Global en la Riviera Maya, que dio origen a los primeros compromisos medibles públicamente para aumentar la inclusión financiera en los países miembros de AFI, lo que hemos llamado la Declaración Maya. Los compromisos de esta declaración deben de seguir siendo luz, nuestra luz guía sobre la cual proseguimos nuestros esfuerzos por un mundo más inclusivo. Hasta ahora, los objetivos de la Declaración Maya han de demostrado ser una herramienta exitosa. A lo largo de la última década, 82 instituciones de 73 países se reunieron para comprometerse con la Declaración Maya y establecer más de 900 objetivos. Los miembros de AFI han sido testigos del progreso logrado por nuestra comunidad en los primeros años. Los compromisos se centraron en sentar la base, las bases para la inclusión financiera, como la recopilación de datos, la creación de consejos nacionales de inclusión financiera y el desarrollo de nuestras primeras estrategias o políticas para implementar la inclusión financiera. Estos compromisos continúan, han demostrado cuánto hemos conquistado. Muchos de los objetivos actuales están relacionados con la implementación de leyes, la promulgación de regulaciones para permitir esquemas bancarios abiertos, fortalecer los derechos de privacidad y datos, reducir el delito cibernético, aumentar la aceptación de los servicios financieros digitales, esto es, entre otras cosas. Debemos de recordar que desde el 2011, más de 1.200 millones de adultos en todo el mundo han obtenido una cuenta bancaria o de transacciones según la base de, de, de datos del Global Findex, aumentando la proporción de adultos con una cuenta al 76% frente al 51%. Sin embargo, quedan desafíos para hacer 
que los servicios financieros sean inclusivos, útiles y valiosos para todas las personas. Los sistemas financieros todavía tienen desafíos para llegar a las poblaciones de última milla, como mujeres, jóvenes, migrantes, refugiados, desplazados por las fuerzas y habitantes rurales. Además del tradicional desafío de incluir a los más vulnerables, nuevos temas emergentes como el calentamiento global, el envejecimiento de la población, las personas con discapacidad y más recientemente los refugiados, los migrantes y la pandemia de COVID-19 nos obliga a ser más estratégicos a través de objetivos generales de la inclusión financiera. Nosotros, como miembros de AFI, tenemos la vocación de continuar abogando por el establecimiento de nuevos compromisos de inclusión financiera que sean más ambiciosos, pero también realistas y sostenibles. Si bien la digitalización ya era un proceso avanzado, la pandemia y algunas medidas implementadas, implementadas para su contención la han acelerado. Los datos en nuestro país y en otras latitudes parecen mostrar con claridad que la población usuaria de servicios financieros tiene cada vez más confianza en realizar superaciones a través de medios electrónicos, así como acceder a los servicios financieros por conducto de nuevos participantes, como son las empresas fintech, la adopción digital, es un proceso que no tiene marcha atrás. Si bien es importante continuar enfocando nuestros esfuerzos en favor de esta coyuntura innovadora, debemos tener siempre en cuenta los retos y las necesidades de que derivan de nuestro entorno económico, social y ambiental, con la finalidad de que nuestras aportaciones institucionales sean las más adecuadas para no dejar a nadie atrás. En este sentido, nosotros como miembros de AFI debemos continuar abogando por el establecimiento de nuevos compromisos de inclusión financiera, que sean ambiciosos, realistas. Por otro lado, las finanzas abiertas y la incorporación de la digitalización representan herramientas poderosas para la inclusión financiera que debemos seguir priorizando entre otros productos financieros innovadores del mercado. Estos productos deberán satisfacer mejor las necesidades del consumidor financiero, fomentar la competencia y conducir a costos más bajos en este escenario. La alfabetización financiera y digital, así como la protección del consumidor financiero, serán siempre de suma importancia. El encomiable trabajo actual de, EFI, de AFI debe continuar basándose en su plan estratégico fase 3, 2019-2023, sustentado en tres objetivos estratégicos. Primero, orientación para diseñar políticas de inclusión financiera, incluida 
la discusión y los resultados de los grupos de trabajo e iniciativas regionales. Segundo, implementación de políticas en el país, incluidos los programas de desarrollo de capacidades de AFI. Y tercero, el establecimiento de agenda en el discurso de inclusión financiera global, incluidas interacciones con los organismos financieros internacionales, establecedores de estándares y otras partes interesadas de inclusión financiera. Aprovecho para extender mis más sinceras felicitaciones a los organizadores y especialmente a el primer ministro de Jordania por esta excelente convocatoria que ha logrado reunir a tantos expertos de todo el mundo para discutir sobre los avances, inquietudes y siguientes pasos para avanzar juntos en un futuro inclusive y sostenible. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. Dr. Rodriguez, ladies and gentlemen, can we please give him another round of applause? Thank you so much, Dr. Rodriguez, for those very powerful remarks uh, that really reinforces the need to move forward together post-pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together now to welcome Dr. Alfred Hennig, the Executive Director, Alliance for Financial Inclusion. Excellency, Bishal Kazavni, Prime Minister and representative of His Majesty King Abdullah II, son of Al Hussein, His Excellency Dr. Adel Al Sharkas, Governor, Senator of Jordan, Dr. Jesus de la Fuente Rodriguez, President of the Comisión Nacional Bancaria de Valores y Vivir de México, and also Chair of the AFI Board. Doctora Rocío, Rocío Aguila Montoya, Superintendent of the Superintendencia General de Entidades Financieras de Costa Rica. Esteemed board members of AFI, governors and deputy governors, members of the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, AFI partners, colleagues. Good morning, and I would like to thank, first of all, His, His Majesty, King Abdullah II, for taking the patronage of this event, which is a very important one, actually the most important one for AFI in a year. I'm happy to be here and to see you all, but I would like to start perhaps with a joke that I heard a few times over the past two years, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. This is really the question, what did you hear most in the past two years when we are still virtual. Which, sen which sentence did you hear most? No. You are muted. <laughs> you are muted. Huh? And sometimes, actually, people went further and said, we can't hear you yeah? on the screen. We can't hear you. Well, it's true. We couldn't hear each other. And we were muted. And now we are no longer muted. And this is great. <laughs> Nevertheless, we can't deny it, no? COVID-19 had an impact on our mental well-being. True, there was a lot of initial excitement on the new opportunities that the pandemic brought to us, such as working from home, making more use of virtual connections, all that. And many people 
were even very quick to, delay, uh, to declare what they called a new normal. A new normal. On the other hand, the, the pandemic had really an, a mental impact on generations. Even, even our kids, even our kids did not socialize for two years in some countries. And we are yet to feel this impact. But at the same moment, we should remember those who we have lost along the way because of this disease. Now, as we seem to have overcome the worst of the health crisis, yeah, the world is still, or should I say again, in turmoil. Skepticism, pessimism, gloomy outlooks on the future, ongoing segregation, even armed conflicts and wars, um, especially in Eastern Europe. All these are threatening the prosperity of our societies these days. However, and this is the good news, the mere fact yeah, that we are here to celebrate Afi's reunification, as a German citizen, I can speak about the reunification. No? At the GPF this week, here in Jordan, this is an impressive signal that our organization is alive, yeah? is alive during these daunting times and ready to address the challenges of exclusion that we have ahead of us. The world needs optimism and the feeling of belonging. Afi stands for both, and it must have been the optimists who have brought us to Jordan. Just to recall, when we adjourned the last GPF in Kigali in September 2019, this Indonesian gong here on the stage, which symbolizes Afi's journey since its inception, was handed over to the Central Bank of Jordan. And you will be surprised who we are going to hand it over at the end of this event. Now, the former CBJ governor, Ziad Faris, who in 2019 submitted his expression of interest on behalf of the CBJ to host this GBF, in 2020, he maintained this invitation throughout two years. We had phone calls phone calls in 2020 and 2021 at times when it became clear that the condition in the health, con the health situation would not allow us to hold this forum. When I then asked Governor Faris over the phone whether he wants to maintain, he always said, of course we will maintain this invitation. Because the pandemic is teaching us so many lessons we want to share with the rest of the world. And these words actually became part of this and inspired this topic that we are looking at. It's about resilience, inclusivity, and sustainable future. And it was Governor al Sharkas who actually maintained very forcefully this invitation. And now we are here under the patronage of His Majesty the King. Abdullah II. So I think we can be very grateful and we submit our sincere appreciation to the country of Jordan. <clears throat> For sure we could have held this uh, forum uh, in different ways, virtually. And there were opportunities. Afi was even trying to um, you know, uh, develop with some providers web pl uh, platforms that would at least allow, allow us to give us some kind of community feeling. But all these efforts were not successful, so we decided we should not water down the brand of this event. We wait until we can go back to normal and actually back to face to face. And surprisingly, despite all this, this pandemic did not take us apart. I actually feel it brought us even closer together. And this, I think, led also um, to the members' activities that were much more active in connecting and using the services in the best possible way. And indeed, we have seen a lot of progress over the past years globally in financial inclusion. You will get a presentation from the World Bank late, later today on the recent FINDEX, where you will actually see that the numbers went down, even the gender gap. We, we managed, finally, to crack up this very stubborn gender gap, at least bring it down from 9 to 6 percent. It is oftentimes argued that the COVID-19 pandemic proved to be a catalyst to speed up implementation of financial inclusion 
policies. But what are the most, the most impressive and the most important policy developments we have seen? I mean, <clears throat> one I need to mention is digital financial inclusion. It actually has proven to be what in investment bankers call <laughs> an all-weather policy solution. In good times, it can provide opportunities to transact efficiently, save safely, plan for the future, and create economic opportunities for micro-enterprises. In tough times, it can actually become an essential lifeline for vulnerable populations to receive social transfers and remittances. Now, as a result, many countries have moved forward very strongly on the digital financial services agenda. Second, we also have seen that there have been so many efforts on reaching out to disadvantaged groups, to women, to, to the youth, to the forcibly displaced persons with disabilities. And for all these groups, the AFI members have told us recently that there is a higher priority. In some cases, it went up by 50% such in the case of youth. Youth is now one of the core priorities of the regulators in this room. And we have made impressive progress on these. And then there was a third development that you're all aware of, and that is central bank digital currency. I think that was a topic that kept you all busy. But the truth is that up to now, only two central banks in this network, namely Bahamas and Nigeria, have had a full rollout of central bank digital currency. And I'm saying this, <laughs> And I'm saying this, there's an enormous necessity to learn from each other. Um, it has proven so far not to be a silver bullet, for financial inclusion at least. But we need to get it right. The design needs to be driven by a clear and achievable goal and designed to be fit for purpose. Then it can work and let's see how far we can get. Now, these are good news, but I must say, and I would like to follow up on our chair, Jesus de la Fuente. Um, despite all these great achievements, it looks as if we have to work even harder. And I would like to follow up on this point and just share with you that we feel that there is a necessity now to look at long-term, long-term policy solutions. Many of the challenges we are currently facing, um, they are with us for a long time. Come on, I mean, gender is there for a long time. And climate is there for a long time. And even forcibly displaced and refugee issues are there for a long time. Yeah? But do we have, have we have solved the problem? No. So what it needs, <clears throat> I think this is our conviction, it does not only need additional efforts, it needs other solutions. And this is my call to this forum. Start thinking about the long-term solution, because we need to get these problems under control. Now, addressing this, what I'm saying, is not only a responsibility for the, the people um, who work under the AFI umbrella as a member. It's again a community, and we depend on others to join us in actually managing these tasks. So I would like to thank our funding partners. Allow me to thank our funding partners who help us in getting our job done. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the German Ministry for Economic Creation and Development, the BNZ, the German Ministry for Environment, Nature, Conservation, Nuclear Safety and Consumer Protection, the BMUV, the Swedish CEDA, the French Development Agency, the MasterCard Foundation, Flourish Ventures, the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office of the United Kingdom, the F FCDO, the Ministry of Finance of Luxembourg, the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs of Luxembourg, and the IDRC in Canada. They're all with us, and I think that's great. We have managed to diversify our partnership. Thank you for that. I also would like to acknowledge AFI's PPD partners, the public-private dialogue partners, Visa, Mastercard, Vodacom, Home Credit, Tunes, Celo, as well as our strategic partners as the World Bank, GIZ, and IMF, among others. Now, it is actually the first time in AFI's history that we were, <laughs> sorry for that, uh, forced to turn down registrations. Normally, I would pick up the phone, I would call the governor or any of the members and say, please think about your registration. This time, we had so many requests, we couldn't even actually host everyone. And what is heartening, and I want to say this, although um, it makes this a bit longer, but you know, we always think about our own preparation for these forums. Yeah? We are very busy and we are totally underwater, but 
you know, I, I happened to see an email from a, from a colleague recently, from a governor to his team, I wasn't supposed to see it, where he actually said, we have to perform at this And they're all preparing. So it's so great to see that you're all preparing as much as we are preparing. So everyone wants to do a good job, and everyone wants to have a great um, performance. Now, to conclude, Your Excellency, Mr. Prime Minister, we carry the word inclusion in our name. Our members conceive financial inclusion as one of the key pillars of financial stability. And we have seen that progress in financial inclusion can be catalyzed by using a cooperation model which is based on open exchange, mutual learning, free flow of information, and due respect for each other. Therefore, both the commitment for inclusion as well as the cooperation model, these are the building blocks of, we do, of what we call our DNA and the DNA of this organization. And this will make us stronger in a post-pandemic world. Excellencies, members, and partners, to conclude, the DNA of AFI is embedded in the country where we are right now in Jordan. A small country in size, yet bigger because of its exceptional people, its diversity in nature, its diversity in nature, its, <clears throat> its diversity and unity, and its commitment to the global causes. This image here shows the first I learned, I'm not that educated, I learned it here. The image here shows the first and oldest map of the world made of mosaic and located in Madaba. And I quickly looked it up on the net. What is a mosaic? A mosaic is a surface decoration made by inlaying small pieces of variously colored material to form a picture or pattern. Here, Jordan is the small piece of mosaic, which will not be complete without each of the pieces. Something Jordan and Afi as a network share. We are uniting the small pieces together to make a more stable, human, fair, and prosperous society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Henig, ladies and gentlemen, those very powerful and inspiring words. A big round of applause, please. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it is now my esteemed pleasure to invite our keynote speaker. Please welcome Superintendent, Superintendencia General de Entidades Financieras de Costa Rica, Dr. Ruscio Aguilar Montoya. Please make her feel welcome. Buenos días tengan todos ustedes. Su Excelencia, Doctor Bisher Hassaune, Primer Ministro y Representante de Su Majestad el Rey Abdullah II. Su Excelencia, Doctor Adel Alcharcas, Gobernador del Banco Central de Jordania. Doctor Jesús de la Fuente Rodríguez, Presidente de la Comisión Nacional Bancaria y de Valores de México y presidente de la Junta Directiva de la Alianza para la Inclusión Financiera. Doctor Alfred Hanin, director ejecutivo de la Alianza para la Inclusión Financiera. Señoras y señores, tengan todos ustedes unos muy buenos días. Para mí es verdaderamente un honor acompañarlos en esta ceremonia de apertura del Foro Política Global AFI 2022, por lo que doy mi más sincero agradecimiento en nombre de todos los representantes a los anfitriones del evento por la espléndida acogida que nos han brindado. Vengo de un pequeño país, de un país muy verde, de un país que todos, al igual que ustedes, aspiramos cada vez por un mundo mejor. 
Aprovecho estos minutos para referirme precisamente a uno de los temas que se han tocado y es la interconexión y el papel de AFE. La interconexión global no es ni más ni menos que la capacidad de conectarnos, compartir, relacionarnos y movilizar a través de diferentes divisiones geográficas, políticas, económicas, sociales y culturales para múltiples fines. Y qué mejor ejemplo que esta extraordinaria y magna actividad a la que nos congrega AFI, reuniendo el talento de diferentes partes del mundo con quienes compartiremos para conectarnos y amalgamar en una sola voz nuestros desafíos para lograr cada vez mayor inclusión financiera como palanca para reducir la pobreza, desigualdad e impulsar la prosperidad. Y lo hacemos desde este maravilloso lugar, posiblemente una de las ciudades más antiguas del planeta, como antiguos son los problemas de la desigualdad y de la inclusión financiera. Un claro ejemplo de interconexión lo vivimos cotidianamente en los productos que consumimos y su impacto en las condiciones en las que vive y trabaja la gente en diversas partes del mundo, pues una mayoría de estos son producidos a miles de kilómetros de distancia, no siempre en condiciones de protección laboral, involucrando el trabajo de menores en algunos casos y con contaminación al ambiente. Y es así que dentro de esta vasta y compleja red de conexiones, para bien o para mal, generamos directa o indirectamente un impacto los unos en los otros. No debemos ignorar esta realidad, ya que cuando lo hacemos, nuestro mundo se polariza todavía aún más. En este sentido, el COVID-19 ejemplifica perfectamente cuán interconectados estamos en el mundo. Un virus que se propagó de un animal a un ser humano en una parte del planeta se convirtió en una pandemia global en solo unos pocos meses, generando una crisis inédita para la humanidad, inédita por su cobertura mundial, por sus impactos en lo sanitario, por su impacto en lo económico, en lo laboral, y en el campo de la logística, entre otros. Esta pandemia, sin embargo, nos ha dejado múltiples lesiones y lecciones. Ya nos mencionaba el doctor Henin algunas de ellas. Cada uno de nosotros ha sido víctima de la pérdida de un familiar, de un amigo, de un colega, de un conocido cuya partida no esperábamos. Hemos visto profundas transformaciones en el mercado laboral, no solo la pérdida de muchísimos puestos de trabajo, sino la reconversión de otros, ya sea por cambios en la demanda o bien por nuevos desarrollos tecnológicos que se aceleraron definitivamente en este periodo de pandemia. La casi inmediatez con que la humanidad logró contar con una vacuna salvó también miles de personas. La interrupción de las cadenas de logística que funcionaban en perfecta sincronía se desajustaron y aún hoy día, lo sabemos, no han logrado restablecerse a su nivel prepandemia. Por la sencilla razón que los cambios generados por esta fueron realmente profundos. Y cuando esperábamos que esta pandemia nos dejara, no solo aparecen nuevas variantes, sino que enfrentamos Ahora, otros desafíos generados en conflictos geopolíticos, ataques cibernéticos, marcados efectos del cambio climático, fuertes restricciones macroeconómicas, un menor crecimiento, altos niveles de inflación en la mayoría de nuestros países, que conducirán indefectiblemente a un menor ingreso disponible, un aumento en las tasas de interés y lamentablemente en la mayoría en nuestro continente un menor espacio fiscal. Concentrándose o afectando todos estos, efectos, estos temas como suelen hacerlo 
en los grupos más vulnerables, grupos que nos recordaba acertadamente el doctor de la Fuente. Así que este entorno nos exige hoy más que nunca demostrar el poder de trabajar juntos por un objetivo común. Aprovechar el beneficio que esta crisis también catapultó, el impacto transformador de la tecnología, la cual nos ha permitido desde la atención de citas médicas virtuales, la reunión de jefes de Estado, el teletrabajo, la educación en línea y la inmersión de las personas, de los ciudadanos al contacto con la tecnología, que posiblemente no hubieran hecho uso de esta, no solo para realizar trámites de diversa índole, sino para ser beneficiarios de ayuda que la mayor parte de los estados lograron entregar a sus gentes. Continuar laborando desde la casa o incluso reunirnos en familia o amigos de una manera diferente, aunque añoramos, y esto es un claro ejemplo, la presencialidad. El identificar y reconocer el valor de esta interconexión, de esta importante red, es piedra angular en nuestro caso, por el rol como emisores de política y regulación, ya que podemos impactar a muchas personas por nuestras decisiones, pero también con nuestras omisiones. Y esa es una responsabilidad que conllevamos todos los que tenemos la oportunidad de ejercer, empujar un cambio desde esta posición que estamos hoy día eh, ejerciendo. Para nosotros entonces resulta estratégico contar con un medio que nos permita tener contacto con la realidad de otras personas. Y ustedes son fiel ejemplo de todo lo que ese mundo representa, de sus experiencias, de sus necesidades, para que nos provea realmente un medio para sustentar de mejor forma esta toma de decisiones que al regreso de nuestros países, a partir de este aprendizaje, debemos todos profundizar. Y justamente aquí es donde AFI ha desempeñado un papel invaluable como plataforma de contacto, como medio para conectarnos, pero como medio para conformar este ecosistema de inclusión financiera para abordar el desafío que todos tenemos. Un logro que indiscutiblemente merece ser resaltado. Un paso en la dirección correcta para acercarnos más al objetivo de conseguir un mundo más próspero, inclusive, resiliente y sostenible. A todos, muchísimas gracias y como decimos en nuestro país, pura vida. Dr. Montoya, ladies and gentlemen, please, another big round of applause. <laughs> Delegates and esteemed guests, it is now a great honor and privilege to have our ceremonies this morning officiated by our guest of honor, His Excellency, Dr. Bashir al Kasoni the representative of His Majesty King Abdullah II, son Al Hussein, and Honorable Prime Minister, please, let's make him feel welcome. Very good morning to, to you, friends. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, Dr. Hanning, Dr. Montoya, Your Excellency, my friend, uh, Dr. Adel Charkas, thank you for convening this splendid event in Jordan. Uh, dear guests, colleagues, and uh, indeed a manifold of distinguished friends in, uh, in the audience, uh, it's an honor and privilege to deputize for His Majesty uh, King Abdullah II, uh, who has bestowed upon this very important event 
his kind patronage and honored me with deputizing on, on His Majesty's behalf to be uh, with you uh, this morning uh, in this uh, very important event. Before I shift and switch to uh, my written speech, I just wanted to make a few comments drawing on uh, the remarkable uh, interventions that were made by the distinguished speakers who preceded me on this uh, podium. Uh, this event was delayed by two years as a result of um, the COVID pandemic. Uh, in as much as Jordan is concerned, nonetheless, um, I think that convening it at this particular time is very pertinent because it coincided with the launching of a comprehensive reform agenda that was shepherded by His Majesty the King uh, as Jordan entered its second centennial we are embarking on comprehensive reforms in three dimensions, the economic dimension, and to that effect, we have launched a vision for 10 years uh, that aspires to put us at achieving a sustainable and comprehensive growth rate of 5.5% and to create employability for around 1 million Jordanians over the course of the next 10 years. We have also uh, adopted a roadmap for administrative reform and indeed, uh, we have enacted legislation and constitutional amendments pertaining to uh, political reforms and encouraging political party life in this country uh, in the context of uh, further political uh, inclusion in addition to the economic inclusion and indeed revamping all the measures that would facilitate the processes of inclusion by revamping the public sector uh, and uh, indeed, uh, one of the components of the administrative reform is the digital transformation uh, of all the services in Jordan, uh, including the financial services that were referenced by many of the distinguished speakers in their interventions and their speeches as conduits to financial inclusion. But in this particular case in Jordan, it's basically comprehensive inclusion on all the three tiers. So it is very timely that despite the regrettable fact that the advent of COVID delayed this gathering by two years, that this gathering coincides with the launching of these three uh, big undertakings that are shepherded by His Majesty the King on the front of economic reform, political reform, and administrative reform. Uh, this country in particular is a country, uh, Dr. Manning, uh, that acoustically may have suffered the uh, uh, the muted status in, 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 in certain contexts acoustically during COVID-19, but, uh, but this country, like the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, I think there's a common denominator here that basically nothing would mute uh, the drive and the resilience of this country in moving forward, because this is a country that believes, that, that believes fully in collectivity, it believes in collective action. It's a country that basically has a lot of uh, individuality that, uh, that we are, I think, legitimately entitled to brag about, but basically this is a country that believes that collective approaches provide the best solutions uh, to all the challenges and problems and generate a better future that, uh, that carries a lot of sustainability and promise to the world in general. And this is a commitment that basically will always shape and mark uh, how this country deals with various challenges and problems, collectivity and complementarities. Uh, thank you very much, and allow me to just shift now to the Arabic um, uh, written speech and to uh, read in Arabic, if you don't mind. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ashab al-Ma'ali wal-Utufa wal-Sa'adah al-Kiram, al-Duyuf al-Kiram, al-Sayyidat wal-Sa'adah. As'ad Allahu sabahakum jami'an bi kulli khayrin. Yusharrifuni an akuna ma'akum liyum. مندوبا عن سيدي صاحب الجلالة الهاشمية الملك عبد الله الثاني بن الحسين حفظه الله وأعز ملكه افتتاح منتدى السياسات العالمي لتحالف الشمول المالي لعام 2022 بحضور هذه النخبة المميزة من ضيوف الأردن الأعزاء من مسؤولين وخبراء ومختصين فأهلا وسهلا بكم جميعا واسمحوا لي بداية أن أنقل إليكم تحياتي سيدي صاحب الجلالة حفظه الله وتمنياته لكم بطيب الإقامة وبتحقيق ما يصب إليه هذا المنتدى العالمي المهم من آمال وتطلعات تخدم أهدافنا جميعا 
وأود أن أعرب عن سعادتنا الكبيرة في الأردن باستضافة هذا الحدث العالمي المهم الذي ينعقد رغم التحديات العديدة والتأجيل المتكرر بسبب جائحة كورونا وتداعياتها لكننا عزمنا منذ عام 2019 على استضافة هذا المنتدى المهم لإيماننا الكبير بأهمية ما ينبثق عنه من نقاشات وتوصيات تخدم سياساتنا المالية والاقتصادية السيدات والسادة الحضور لقد كان العامان الماضيان استثنائيين على جميع الأصعدة بسبب جائحة كورونا وما نجم عنها من آثار سلبية عديدة على مختلف القطاعات والفئات المجتمعية ويكفي أن نستشهد بارتفاع معدل الفقر العالمي من 7.8% إلى 9.1% مع نهاية عام 2021 وذلك بحسب بيانات البنك الدولي ولكن ورغم ذلك بقي النظام الاقتصادي العالمي مرنا وبرزت فاعلية الاستجابات والتدابير المطبقة في جميع أنحاء العالم للتخفيف من تداعيات الأزمة وآثارها على القطاعات الاقتصادية المختلفة كما ظهرت الحاجة إلى الإسراع في التحول نحو الاقتصاد الرقمي وهو ما أشار إليه الكثير من من سبقوني في الحديث ورفع مستوى الشمول المالي وإيجاد الحلول المناسبة لتقليص حجم الاقتصاد غير الرسمي بالإضافة إلى استحداث معايير تحوط مناسبة وكافية للتخفيف من حدة النتائج السلبية المتأتية من الصدمات غير المتوقعة على القطاعات الاقتصادية المختلفة سيداتي وسادتي في الأردن لم نكن استثناء على العالم لقد قمنا بالعمل الدؤوب على زيادة الوعي بمخاطر الوباء وانتقلنا بسرعة نحو تبني العديد من الإجراءات والتدابير الاحترازية على صعيد السياستين النقدية والمالية من جهة والحماية الاجتماعية من جهة أخرى وبقيمة إجمالية فاقت 11% من الناتج المحلي الإجمالي أسهمت بشكل فعال في احتواء التداعيات السلبية للجائحة على أداء الاقتصاد الوطني لقد ساعدت هذه التدابير التي اتخذناها إلى جانب الإدارة الحصيفة للاقتصاد الكلي والتقدم المحرز في الإصلاحات الهيكلية والأداء الأفضل في مؤشرات الصادرات الخارجية على استمرار التعافي الاقتصادي في المملكة استسجل الاقتصاد الوطني نموا بنسبة 2.2% في عام 2021 ومن المتوقع بإذن الله أن يستمر زخم النمو خلال عام 2022 مع وصول مستويات الإنتاج في القطاعات الأكثر تضرراً إلى مستويات ما قبل الجائحة وذلك رغم استمرار حالة عدم اليقين والنمو التضخمي في الاقتصاد العالمي سيداتي سادتي تدرك هذه الحكومة حكومة المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية أن استمرار نمو الاقتصاد الوطني يستمد زخمه من السير قدماً في الإصلاحات الاقتصادية والهيكلية والحكومة ملتزمة بالمضي قدما بهذه الإصلاحات الضرورية لمستقبل الأردن المستدام ودعم مشاركة المرأة في القوى العاملة وتعزيز الحكمة والشفافية والتحول بشكل متزايد نحو الاقتصاد الرقمي بما يسهم في تخفيض كلف تأسيس الأعمال وممارستها وتحسين المنافسة وهذا ما تم أخذه بعين الاعتبار في وثيقة رؤية التحديث الاقتصادي التي إشرت إليها قبل قليل والتي تغطي الأعوام العشرة المقبلة التي أطلقناها في حزيران, حزيران الماضي في هذا المكان في البحر الميت برعاية ملكية سامية وهنا وفي معرض الحديث عن هذه الرؤية أؤكد التزامنا بمتابعة تطوير قطاع الأسواق والخدمات المالية كونه الأساس الذي يمكن النمو الاقتصادي ويحسن وصول المواطنين إلى التمويل كما سنلبي الاحتياجات الملحة المرتبطة بتغير المناخ والأمن الغذائي والمائي وتوفير الطاقة النظيفة وسنسعى بجد من أجل تحقيق أهداف التنمية المستدامة العالمية المعلنة من الأمم المتحدة والتوافق مع النهج العالمي نحو مستقبل أخضر بالإضافة إلى حفز شريحة جديدة من الاستثمارات في المشاريع المستدامة لتسهيل الحصول على التمويل الأخضر السيدات والسادة الحضور لقد حظي الشمول المالي باهتمام على عال على, على كل مستوى خلال العقد الماضي باعتباره احد ابرز ممكنات النمو الاقتصادي على مستوى العالم 
لما يتيح للأفراد وقطاع الأعمال خصوصا في المشاريع متناهية الصغر والصغيرة والمتوسطة من الوصول إلى الخدمات والمنتجات المالية بحسب احتياجاتهم وفي مختلف مواقعهم من خلال مؤسسات مالية متخصصة تقدم هذه الخدمات بأعلى درجات المسؤولية وهذا من شأنه تمكين فئات المجتمع من المشاركة في عوائد التنمية والاستفادة منها وتعزيز المشاركة الاقتصادية والاجتماعية والتقليل من مستويات الفقر والبطالة والتوافت الكبير في الدخول وتحسين مستوى المعيشة مما ينعكس إيجابا على جميع محاور التنمية المختلفة التعليم والصحة والنقل وغيرها بالإضافة إلى المساهمة الشمول المالي في رأب الفجوة الجندرية وتمكين الشباب وذلك بتعزيز الاعتماد على الذات من خلال المساهمة الفاعلة في النشاط الاقتصادي نحن في الأردن نؤمن بأن الشمول المالي يشكل ركيزة أساسية نحو النمو الشامل والمستدام إذ أن إدماج المستبعدين عن التعامل مع المؤسسات المالية في الاقتصاد الرسمي من شأنه التقليل من حدة الفقر وجعل الأفراد خصوصا ذوي الاحتياجات ذوي الدخل المحدود أقل عرضة للصدمات المالية وتحسين ظروف المعيشة للجميع ولقد اتخذنا في هذا الصدد خطوات جادة ومهمة للتعامل مع الشمول المالي كهدف استراتيجي وطني فأطلقنا الاستراتيجية الوطنية للشمول المالي للأعوام 2018-2020 والتي حققت جل أهدافها بل وتجاوزتها في بعض المجالات وعملنا من خلالها على توحيد وتأطير المبادرات والجهود الرامية إلى تعزيز الشمول المالي للأفراد وقطاع الأعمال في المملكة كما يعمل البنك المركزي الأردني حاليا وهو المؤسسة الوطنية التي نحييها بالتعاون مع جميع الشركاء على إطلاق استراتيجية وطنية جديدة للاجتمال المالي للعوام 2023-2025 تستهدف زيادة الوصول والاستخدام المسؤول والمستدام للخدمات والمنتجات المالية لمختلف فئات المجتمع بمن فيهم ذوي الدخل المحدود والشباب والنساء واللاجئين والشركات الصغيرة والمتوسطة والمتناهية الصغر ختاما نتطلع بعين الأمل والتفاؤل لانعقاد هذا المنتدى الهام من أجل الخروج بتوصيات ومقترحات قابلة للتطبيق من شأنها النهوض بالشمول المالي وتحسين الفرص للأفراد والفئات المستهدفة ومساعدتنا جميعا في الوصول إلى تحقيق أهداف التنمية المستدامة بما ينعكس إيجابا على مصالح أوطاننا وشعوبنا أجدد الترحاب بكم وأشكر التحالف العالمي للشمول المالي AFI والبنك المركزي الأردني على حسن الإعداد والتنظيم متمنيا لكم جميعا التوفيق والسداد والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا جزيلا There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the official opening of the 2022 AFI Global Policy Forum. Please, another big round of applause. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. I'd like to really say thank you sincerely to the Honorable Prime Minister for officiating such a grand opening 
to this year's Policy Forum. Can I ask that we give him another big round of applause, please? We also say uh, shukran and thank you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Montoya, and also to the Governor of the Central Bank of Jordan for addressing us, and the Chair of AFI and the Executive Director. Let's give them also another big round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, still to come, though we've uh, concluded the opening ceremony, we will move uh, on to the first plenary session in just a moment. But again, we are truly honored and humbled to have, uh, uh, you know, the Honorable Prime Minister to come and officiate this, uh, this ceremony this year here in this beautiful, beautiful city. I have to say, um, you know, with so much history, ladies and gentlemen, it is such an honor uh, to to come all this way and to be treated with such hospitality by the, um, by the central bank here. So let's also extend our sincere appreciation for hosting us over the last few days. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you know, as we host this global forum and the host for the forum have always really spend so much time and effort to prepare to share their journey. And uh, today, that is also what we can expect. And I uh, will hand the program over to, of course, the uh, Central Bank of, uh, of Jordan, who will be really displaying their journey for us uh, today. So we're truly, truly humbled by uh, by this presentation that's coming up, and I'd like to invite uh, none other than uh, Mohammed, who is going to do this wonderful presentation for this session. Thank you so much, everyone. Please be seated. I want to thank you all sincerely. I know we can just uh, take a moment and uh, breathe in. I know I've had you really on a very tight leash there with all these protocols, but thank you all very much for adhering to the protocols and ensuring that we extend that respect to our guest of honor. Let's give each other a big round of applause, everybody. Okay, everyone, uh, just very quickly, we ask that we don't go out yet for, uh, for refreshments. We still have that plenary session. Um, we've been asked that the uh, governor to escort uh, His Excellency, who is uh, just about to depart, and upon his return, then we're going to do that first plenary session. He's just asked uh, politely.
المؤمنين فهموا قيمة التأمين فهتفوا آمين أشوفك مرتاح وقاعد وتارك هالشغل اللي مغلبك وإحنا هنا كلنا حواليك بنخدمك بعيوننا أولا يا با الله يرضى عليك وكلكم ثانيا أنا ما برتاح غير لما أخوك صالح آخر العنقود يخلص دراسته ويجيب شهادته ساعتها برتاح يا با مشوارك مشوار عظيم يا أبو سالم بس بدي أعرف أنت كيف قدرت تدبر أمورك نحن صغار ومدرسة بعدين جامعة خمسة يابا احنا خمسة ما شاء الله مش واحد ولا اثنين قل اعوذ برب الفلق تفضل <تصفيق> <تصفيق> يا ابو سالم يزيد فضلك يسلم ايديك تفضل يما سلم ايديك يما عقولة المثل ما بحسد المال الا اصحابه <تصفيق> لا تقول خمسة يا سالم قول ثلاث اولاد وبنتين ليش هن البنات مش محسوبات يما؟ <تصفيق> لا على سلامتهن درس مثل ما درسته وساعد مثل ما ساعدته وحمل الهم مثل ما حملته اه وبرتكن عليهن في الدار وفي المجتمع كمان 
انت دخلتي وانا بحكي مع ابوي وبساله كيف قدر يدرسني احنا الخمسه بالجامعه وما جاوبني ابو سالم ابوك الله يعطيه العافيه حط القرش على القرش يما وادخر اه قل له يا ابو سالم الله يعطيك العمر يا رب على قد ما تعبت احنا يا ابو تعلمنا نقدر قيمه القرش الابيض لليوم اللي نحتاج فيه انا كنت احلم اني ادرسكم لانه بزماناتي يابا جدك الله يرحمه كان صعب عليه انه يدرسني عشان هيك قررت انه يكون العوض انتو ومع الايام اكتشفت انه اسهل توفير انك تدخر فلوسك في البنك عشان هيك قدرت احوش وقدرت ادرسك انت واخوتك وانا بحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى اللي خلاني ادي هالامانه اللي ما كنت اديها لولا توفيقه سبحانه وتعالى ومساعده هالست الطيبه اللي هي امكم الله يخلي لنا اياك يا ابو سالم تعرف يا با انا قررت افتح حساب توفير شو هو ابو سالم بس اللي بده يدير باله على مستقبل اولاده انا كمان بدي ادير بالي على مستقبل اولادي اه اولادك <تصفيق> قلت لي اه <تصفيق> سالم شو بتساوي انا قلت هسه بقوم يفط على البنك بفتح حساب ادخار يما بس انا بزماناتي فتحت حساب في البنك نفسه سحبت حالي ورحت لهناك انت شو قاعد بتعمل يابا بدك تقول لي انه بتقدر تفتح حساب في البنك بالتلفون وانت قاعد هاد؟ بالضبط بالضبط يا ابو سالم هيك حكيتها هسه بتقدر تفتح الحساب اللي بدك اياه وانت قاعد بالبيت وقدامي فعلا لكل زمان رجال واختراعات علم الانسان ما لم يعلم اه والله بس هاي خدمه بتساعد كثير يا ابو سالم والله يما خايفة على زماننا ليحسد زمانكو <تصفيق> <تصفيق> لا يما لا الشغلة مش شغلة حسد زماننا في تطور كثير كبير وفي معاملات سهلة وميسرة للتعامل مع المؤسسات المالية والبنوك وإحنا كمان لازم نقرأ النشرات والإعلانات اللي بنزلها البنك المركزي والبنوك وكل المؤسسات المالية زرعوا فأكلنا ونزرع ونزرعوا فيأكلون يا أبا سالم مالك المدخر صار طمأنينة شهدا يرشف الأولاد رحيقة زادك الممدود يا أبا سالم وعد الوجود أن نكون بكرامة أو لا نكون افرحي يا أم سالم تدثرت بحسن إدارة المال عرفت يا أبا سالم كيف تدخر بدأت الأيام على وجهها الصحيح فكان لك ما رجوت من الجنى بارك الله فيك يا شيخنا
الوطن شباب خرج للوطن شباب خرج للوطن شباب واحنا رح نتباهى فيه واحنا رح نتباهى فيه جيل ويا بابا سلم جيل جيل ويا بابا سلم جيل ونبني هالوطن نبني نبني هالوطن نبني نبدا بخطوة الالف ميل وعن درب الوفا من ميل نبدا بخطوة الالف ميل وعن درب الوفا من ميل مشوار بعزم بنمشي مشوار بعزم بنمشي صباح الخير يا صباح الورد اهلا حالك امي الحمد لله يما بصراحه انا كنت قاعد بفكر بالموضوع اللي حكيناه واتوقع صار وقت منك تكبري شغلك وانا كمان كنت افكر في الموضوع طيب ها يعني يما انا بقول مع هالماكينه اللي خدمتك سنين ليش ما تشتري لك اكم ماكينه ثانيه وتشوفي لك كم سيدة بيشتغلوا معك بيساعدوك بالخياطة. بعدين أنا شايف ما شاء الله شغلك قاعد عم بيزيد وزباينك قاعدين بيكثروا وهي فرصة عشان نكبر دخلنا. فكرة مش بطالة. يعني أنت هيك شايف؟ طبعا طبعا هيك شايف. بعدين المصاري موجودين والحمد لله. وإذا أنت خايفة تشتريهم مرة واحدة من قصتهم تقسيط. خلص على بركة الله. بكرة إن شاء الله الصبح بننزل على السوق بنشوف أكم من ماكينة كويسة وبسعر معقول. اه بس قبل ما نشتري الماكينات لازم نستاجر لك مشغل ليش المشغل ماله البيت لا البيت ما ماله شيء بس يعني بكره لما يكون في عندك ماكينات زياده ويكون في سيدات قاعدين بيساعدوك يعني البيت راح يكون عجقه مشغل احسن اه شغله مهمه اول ما تشتري الماكينات وتحطيهم في المشغل لازم تامني عليهم لازم لازم يما ما بتعرف القدر بكره ايش مخبي لنا بعدين بكره اذا توسعنا وزاد شغلنا لازم نصير نامن اول باول يا غاليه تأمين بس أنا ما بعرف إيش عن التأمين يعني وين أروح ومين أراجع ما بعرف أنا بعرف أنا بعرف شركة تأمين عروضهم كثير مناسبة لشغلك وسمعتهم طيبة حتى قبل فترة التقيت بواحد من مندوبين هاي الشركة وأعطاني رقمه حتى يومها هلكني هو بيحكي لي عن الثقة ما أنت بتعرفي هلا صار البنك المركزي هو المسؤول عنهم هو اللي بتابع شغله قصدك الفيست كارد شو هي؟ فيست كارد حكيتها غلط؟ <تصفيق> يعني ما بدي اضبط لك اياها صدق تقولي ولدي قاعد بتفلسف علي صح؟ فيست كارد كارد كل واحد <تصفيق> شو ما كانت المهم متى بدك تتصل فيه؟ هسه خيروا البر عاجل مش هيك بيقولوا بس خليني الاقي لك رقمه يلا اه لبين ما احكي معاه خذي شوفي هذا الفيديو هذا راح يشرح لك كل شيء بدك تعرفيه عن التامين عن التامين؟ اه
شفت يا امي النافع ربنا كيف نفعتنا شركه التامين هيهو عوضوكي بكل الماكينات اللي انحرقت الحمد لله الله يرضى عليك يا امي بعدين مش بس الماكينات حتى الايام اللي تعطلت فيها عوضوني عنها هو احنا علمناك وكبرناك ليش مش عشان تدلونا على الصح وتفهمونا اللي قلنا واللي علينا صح صح خلص الحمد لله الحمد لله قدروا لطف يا امي قدروا لطف الله يبعد عنا المصايب يا رب امين امين يا الله ما هو احنا امنا شو مخبي القدر لما يدروا البشر التامين بينفعنا الله ستر عن مزال الخطر ما هو احنا امنا شو مخبي القدر لما يدروا البشر التامين بينفعنا صحيح شو صار معك بموضوع الدراسة؟ حكيت مع الوالدة بالموضوع؟ ما أنت عارف يا صاحبي مش طالع مني أحكي معها بهذا الموضوع بكفي إنها دايرة بال علي من يوم ما توفى الوالد الله يرحمه وهي حامل البيت ومسؤوليته كله أكتافها حتى قصة إني أكمل دراسة مش لازم أعتمد على حدا تاني غيري حتى لو كان أقرب الناس إلي المشكلة إني أنا مش طالع بإيدي إشي حتى الأكم ليرة اللي بطلعهم من محل الخلويات اللي بشتغل فيه يا دوبهم يكفوا أكل ولا شرب بتجيبين همهم الحمد لله طب استنى شوي انت ليش ما تشتري محل من صاحب المحل مش هو عرضه للبيع فعلا أنا أنا فايت شفته كان مكتوب للبيع وخصوصا إنك صرت شاطر بأمور صيانة الأجهزة وبتفهملها منيح منه تمشي أمورك بقرشين وتمشي امور البيت وبتكمل دراستك ومين بيعرف يمكن تتجوز <تصفيق> اشتري محل ايش انت الثاني ما انت شايف وعارف من وين يا حسره ما انت عارف البير وغطايا صاحبي طب ليش ما تاخذ قرض من بنك او من شركه تمويل وانا بكفلك على راتب الوظيفي او حتى بتقدر تحط المحل هذا ضمانه اذا بدك تشتريه واذا بدك تاخذ من شركه تمويل بدون ما تحط المحل حتى ضمانه المهم انك تدرس الموضوع منيح وتعمل دراسة جدول وتشوف هل الدخل الشهري هذا اللي عم بدخل لك بيقدر يسدد القسط ويسدد احتياجاتك بس انا سمعت انه هاي الشركة لا توقع على اي ورقة قبل ما تقرأها كاملة ذكرت اشي مرة سمعته بمحاضرة تثقيفية عملها البنك المركزي 
كانت في الجامعة اللي كنت أدرس فيها المحاضرة كانت بتحكي إنه المتضرر أو اللي بيحس حاله متضرر من بنك أو مؤسسة مالية بيقدر يشتكي عليها للمؤسسة المالية اللي تتعامل معها وإذا ما انحلت أموره بيقدر كمان يشتكي للبنك المركزي نفسه عالي يا سيدي بعدين يا صاحبي إحنا بزمان بطلنا زي أيام الماضي لازم الواحد قبل ما يأخذ أي خطوة يكون عنوره بينة ويفكر فيها منيح هذيك اليوم شفت فيديو إرشادي كيف العميل يتعامل مع أسس المالية ويعرف حقوقه وواجباته حقوقه وواجباته زي ما إحنا بحصة تربية وطنية أنت بتاني طبعا تربية وطنية ولو كل واحد بيعرف إيش إله وإيش اللي عليه لا بضر غيره ولا بضر حاله وبيخدم بلده بتعرف شو شفت بالفيديو إنه كيف لازم نبلشها شو هي اللي بدنا نبلشها أي معاملة بنكية بتعرف إنه البنك المركزي في ناس مختصين بس بمتابعة الشكاوى ولا تعلم إنه في طاقم كامل مختص بمتابعة المؤسسات المالية الغير بنكية وعدا عن هيك أي قرض بكون فيه على عقده البنود والشروط والتسعير كامل وأي تغيير بسعر الفائدة لازم يكون العميل مطلع عليه وقانوني بعدين على وضعك الصحي يا صاحبي وعدم المؤاخذة أنت مش مضطر تقدم تقرير طبي إلا مرة واحدة فقط أول ما تراجع المؤسسة هاي اللي حكيت لك عنها اللي بتعطي قروض ألف مبروك المحل الثاني يا صاحبي الله يبارك مش قلت لك الشغلة بدها شوية جراءة وطبعا لازم تحسبها صح وتبلشها صح هاي شوف بسم الله ما شاء الله محلين وشهادة وخطيبة كمان وكل هذا بسنتين يا عمي لا مش بس هيك خلصت القرض اللي علي كله وبدون أي تعفن وأسا عم بفكر أخذ قرض ثاني وأفتح لي فيه شركة يا سيدي مش غلط مش غلط بس أهم شيء إنك تبلشها صح وتحسبها مني خلص فهمناها لازم دائما نبلش صح. صحيح سمعت انه صاحبك سمير ماخذ قرض تسهيلات ايش؟ ممتازه اخذها. صحيح صحيح سمير اخذ قرض بشروط ميسره وسهله. والسبب انه بده يمد طاقه شمسيه عنده بالبيت. بسموه قرض التمويل الاخضر. ايوه ليكون سيارتك الكهربائيه عن طريق تمويل اخضر. <تصفيق> شو صاير مكشوف عنك الحجاب؟ مظبوط سيدي، سيارتي كهرباء وعن طريق التمويل الاخضر. هو انت لسه بتحكي فيها؟ طبعا راح اخذ قرض اخضر عم بفكر امد طاقه شمسيه واذا احنا ما حمينا البيئه مين بده يحميها ربنا يبارك فيها
باش تزبادي ست الكل وينك حضني في المطبخ وين بالدبكه يعني وين نفسي اشوف ضو كهرباء مطفي في هالدار حتى التلفزيون ما حدا قاعد ومضوي التلفزيون شغال لحاله ستين مره ستين مره قلت وفروا في وفتير الكهرباء والمي انهلكت فواتير بكفيش التعب اللي بتعبه غير مو عزمه المواصلات ووقفه الدور وحرقه الراس وعد كل جت فاتورة ثانية بستين نيرة أخرى بقول لك ستين مرة ستين مرة مش ستين نيرة صحيح ابنك النضوي دفع الفاتورة القديمة ها؟ آه هذا هو تعال يما تعال نعم يا حبيبتي كل أبوك يابا دفعت فاتورة ستين نيرة أقسم بالله دفعتها يابا أقسم بالله دفعتها بدون لا مواصلات ولا أزمة ولا أزمة طبور كله صار عن طريق الجوال شو؟ جوال؟ اه, آه يعني قصدي انه صار في خدمات كثيره منها تحويل، دفع فواتير، اقصى جامعه وغيره وغيراته بالله بالله يا حبيبي ماك وشو بضمن انه الفاتوره وصلت للشركه؟ ولكن انت بدك تجلطني انت وامك تجلطني اذا اذا ما وصلت المصاري امم يا حسرتي هو البخت من شرع يا ربي امه تجلطك ليش؟ انا اجلطك ليش؟ انا بجلطك يابا ما بصير ما يوصلوش هاي كلها آليات حديثة وآمنة و... وأونلاين بالله أونلاين أهلين أونلاين ومن إيه بتاع الحكي يابا الدنيا تغيرت والخدمات تطورت طب يما يا حبيبي طالما أنت شاطر يعني بهالحكي هذا تبع الأونلاين يعني كل كيف بنقدر نودي مصاري لأخوك في الغربة تأخرنا عليه يا حبيبي بدي يدفع قصة الجامعة بدي يدفع جار الدار فيش معه مصروف كلي يوه يما والله ما في ولا سهل منها ولك كيف سهلة كيف سهلة أبوك شاب شعره وهو يدور على واحد يحمل هالكرشين ووديه لأخوك طيب بتعرفوا جارنا اللاجئ اه ابو فارس ماله اه ابو فارس عرفت ابو فارس هذا مرته حلوه برا تقول ايه تقبلني عرفت <تصفيق> ايوه ابو فارس جارنا اللاجئ اه قبل اسبوعين سالني آه اذا بعرف كيف ممكن اخليه يستلم حواله ابنه اللي جاي من اوروبا والله وانا سالت واكتشفت انه في شيء اسمه المحفظه الالكترونيه وبقدر يستخدمها اللاجئ عن بعد <تصفيق> مالك يا ولد مالك يا ولد شو دخل هالحكي ب 60 ليره والمصاري بدها تحول لاخوك المهم يابا المهم ساعدت لهالجار والله رحت وسالت له ودورت وعرفت كيف قدر يتواصل مع ابنه ماليا ويستلم منه الحواله ولك لخمتنا ولك ولك هبلتنا ولك ولك شو دخل تحويلي ابو فارس بالمصاري بدنا نوديه لاخوك في الغربه <تصفيق> يا يما يا حبيبتي اللي بقصده أنا إنه إذا أبو فارس بظرفه استلم المصاري من ابنه من أوروبا وقدر يتعامل بالأمور المالية وطلع محفظة إلكترونية إلكترونية يابا لأنه اللي جاي كله زمن الأونلاين أونلاين؟ أهلين أونلاين إحنا أندر لاين مزابط معنا تيزبط معنا أونلاين <تصفيق> شو حج لغات وحركات هسا دشرونا من درس اللغات اللي انتو فيه كيف بدنا نحول مصاري لاخوك طيب يا ما متى ما حكيت لك من قبل نحن بنقدر نحول المصاري واحنا هون قاعدين بالبيت سمعت اقول لك ولا سمعت اقول لك ابو على فاتوره 60 ليره بقى بده ينجلط مصاري اخوك هون قدي بنروح فيها ابوك يا ماما يا حبيبتي متى ما حكينا من قبل عن طريق تطبيق الاونلاين بابا اعطيني تليفونك بعد اذنك هسا بتشوفوا كيف رح نوصل له بالصوت والصورة وبأقل من دقيقة <تصفيق> مجيل طشش ورجينا ورجينا تشوف شي بدها تروح الحوالة طير طيران يعني مش عارف شو تم هاي 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 مسج من ابنك وصلته الحواله هات 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 انطيني احكي معه انطيني احكي معه بقول لك مسج مسج رساله مش مكالمه والله مسج مسج مش مكالمه هسا صرت خبير بالاونلاين بيني وبينك احنا اللي طلعنا جيل طشش اسمعي لازم احنا نطور حالنا ونواكب العصر وخدماته
لا يا با حشاكو بس نحن زماننا غير عن زمانكو يعني تعرف طيب يا با زبطني بكبسة زر لقي لي عروس أونلاين كبر عزو لسع الزلمة قد 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 هاي الخدمات اخترعوها عشان يريحوا الناس مش عشان يجرطوا الناس اقعد صحيح يا با هاي البرامج انعملت عشان مثلا بدك تدفع فواتير بدك تحول قص جامعي هذا هو الحكي هذا هو هذا مش تقعد ما تقدر تتجوز اقعد خلي الطابق مسطور انت دار واحدة مش كاين فيها لتقوم بدارين زبطني زبطني اونلاين يا با زبطني تش علي يا ما تش علي اقعد العكل زيني الو يا ها وصلتك الحوالي يما يا حبيبي كيف حالك كيف حالك يا حبيبي كيف صحتك يما دير بالك على دروسك يا با اول شيء دفعت دفع على الجامعه يا ما حبيبي انت حبيبي. خلاص اول باول بتصلك يما صار يا ما تعزك ليش ضعفان دير بالك على حالك يا دير بالك على حالك يا با حدث حافظ بلش صح أجدادك عملوا الصح تابع قدر ابدأ صح الادخار بذار القرض حل التأمين أمان الدفع والتحويل خدمة للتسهيل الشباب مستقبل أجدادك حرة السهل حمل المنجل المرأة خصب الأرض دفء السماء افهم حقك بالوما الصبر موسم والعلم كل المواسم انت بتسأل وكنا بنسأل لوين رايحين حابين نسهل هالدرب باليقين ونهتف مد هالمدى بالوعي مكملين بالترشيد بالرأي السديد ايد بايد بالحرس الاخضر بخير كل مطحنة وبيدر وبكيف نعرف اللي قلنا ونقر باللي علينا حدث حافظ بلش صح تابع قدر ابدأ صح
Ladies and gentlemen, please, another big round of applause for this absolutely marvelous performance this morning. Let's congratulate the Governor of the Central Bank of Jordan and his entire team for this beautiful performance. What an absolutely uh, journey to share with us and uh, many realities around that. Conversations very similar to those, I'm sure, from other countries. But it's such a beautiful performance, a lovely cultural presentation, and we're truly, truly honored to have been witness to that wonderful performance. Again, congratulations to you and the entire team, uh, Governor. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take a short break now for um, a coffee break and networking, but please, we ask that we return. We'll commence with the next next part of our ceremony at 11.25, as expected, we'll be back here for that video presentation. We ask that we move right across. We've got refreshments all the way to the uh, Gilgamesh um, main foyer area. We can go there, but return before 11.25 for the next presentation. Thank you so much.
provision, promotion, protection and prevention to inform inclusive green finance policy development. Our inclusive green finance working group now includes 60 members from more than 50 countries and to date we have seen a total of 10 policy changes on inclusive green finance, 13 Maya declaration commitments and several in-country implementation projects already underway. In September 2022, we updated and recommitted to the Sharm El Sheikh Accord on Inclusive Green Finance. And together with our partners, our work on inclusive green finance is bringing real impact and improved livelihoods to the most vulnerable. By strengthening those that are most vulnerable, we are building more inclusive and resilient financial systems. Join us. Ladies and gentlemen, we congratulate them also on updating the uh, Sharm El Sheikh Accord on Inclusive Green Finance yesterday. Please, a big round of applause. This is one, of course, uh, the youngest policy areas in AFI, but one that is quickly gaining traction and progressing rapidly. And uh, it's also a great way to introduce uh, our next session, which is a plenary two the financial inclusion in the post-pandemic world, emerging policy priorities and pathways, because some of our panel members that we'll hear from in this next session will also speak to what we've just seen as well. So this is a great way to introduce this next session. Ladies and gentlemen, for this plenary session, I would like to hand the microphone over to um, a young man that many of you know as well, and we've met a number of times at these very forums. So we're very, very happy to have him here to introduce our panel members and also to moderate that session. Let's put our hands together for the lead financial sector specialist, um, a CGAP. He's none other than Mr. Michael Tarazi, everyone. Wow. What, what a pleasure to be off mute after three years. It is, it is just terrific um, to see you all. I'm sure many of you share my happiness in being able to see old friends, uh, to make new friends, and to continue to strengthen this very important alliance for financial inclusion. Uh, the panel this morning is an important one on sort of the post-pandemic world, and I'd like to invite our panelists on stage right now. Uh, we'll start with the Governor al Sharkas from the Central Bank of Jordan, Governor Enari from the Central Bank of Samoa, if you could please join me on stage, Deputy Governor Bijewe from the Central Bank of Kenya, uh, Salim Ergos from MasterCard, and Laura Foski from Ada Luxembourg. If you could please join me on stage for the panel, I appreciate it. Let me start with Mohamed Amaira, who informs me that the governor, al Sharkas won't be able to join us for the panel. Uh, some last minute important issues came up, but I, I want to start with you, first of all, thank you and the Central Bank of Jordan team for, for hosting us. It's a pleasure to be here in your beautiful country. I wanna talk to you about your experience under COVID and what, what recommendations you might have for other regulators, because the conventional wisdom is digital financial services was perfect because people couldn't get together and so this pandemic was actually great for financial inclusion because it forced people into the digital world. Was that your experience in Jordan? And if, it, and, and if so, what, what lessons do you have for other regulators based on COVID in Jordan? Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, welcome all of you to Jordan for, for this very fruitful uh, conference and would like to, to thank Afi for organizing uh, this uh, uh, forum in Jordan. I think the pandemic uh, 
as we uh, know all, uh, had uh, a negative impact on all the economic sectors and individuals. That's why uh, one of the most important messages that I want to, to deliver is the, uh, the collaboration between uh, public and private sector. I think uh, the collaboration between public and private sector and other stakeholders is a crucial and essential uh, for reducing the impact of any crisis. That's why in Jordan, during the pandemic, we had a very comprehensive collaboration between the government and uh, between the Central Bank of Jordan and the financial sector in general uh, and the civil society organizations. Uh, so one hand cannot clap. So I think very important to enhance the coordination, to work as one team in order to uh, reduce the impact of any crisis in the future. Also, uh, I think one of the most important messages that we noticed, and I think uh, all over the world noticed it, that the importance of digital financial services and financial technology. I think digital financial services proved to be very uh, effective tools uh, to ensure the continuation of the work, to ensure uh, that uh, money transfers will continue to uh, the low-income people. So uh, investing in the digital financial services and uh, financial technology in general is very important. I think also we have to be uh, uh, prepared uh, all the time. Uh, we have to have uh, maybe a strong uh, financial and technical infrastructure. So investing in the infrastructure uh, through the partnership between the public sector and private sector is uh, essential in uh, dealing with any uh, crisis. One thing also I want to emphasize on that, the uh, crisis maybe uh, uh, give signals in how to uh, create a balance between uh, supporting the economy and reducing the impact of uh, the crisis on it and between preserving and maintaining the financial stability. So this is very important how to balance between these two goals, to, to still have a solid uh, financial system and also to uh, reduce the impact and uh, continue supporting uh, the economy. So I think these messages are very important and one of the most important lessons learned during the pandemic. Okay, so let me just recap. The importance of public-private partnerships, uh, the importance of digital infrastructure, which I assume will be something you're going to invest in going forward, and then the connection, and, I, and it's interesting because I know we'll, have, we'll hear from the private sector in just a moment about you know, your feelings uh, and lessons. And then, of course, the, um, the importance of understanding the balance between the micro and the macro on the economic policy, and I think we're going to hear more from our colleagues on that. But let me move from Jordan, a country of 10 million people that is largely landlocked, to a small island nation in Samoa, which is not landlocked, uh, with about 200,000 population. What was your experience, Governor Inari, in Samoa during COVID, and what, what key messages do you have for fellow regulators? Um, thank you, Michael. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm from a country of uh, 200,000 people for the last... Um, so many.
um, have been quite resilient in the face of the pandemic. Um, in fact, it's one of uh, a few bright spots and since we encountered COVID-19. The lockdowns and the need for social distancing has pushed to the, to the fore the value of going digital. So uh, with remittances, this is evident in a strong pickup uh, in remittances sent uh, via electronic money transfer operators. For information, 80 to 85% of remittances to Samoa are channeled through money transfer operators. So um, mobile money is readily available, already available in the country, but um, we need to scale up its usage. Um, I have, I think I've been emphasizing digital financial services and remittances, but the same goes with, uh, with government financial assistance in times of crisis to be more effectively and efficiently dispersed. So um, we have had instances during lockdown and quarantine that people had to jump over the fence to go and uh, get access cash from ATM or, to, uh, or from uh, money, money transfer operators. Um, but uh, since November 2020, only 2.7% of remittances came through electronic money transfer operators, but now in February, it's now gone up to 18%. Uh, so that is a, it's a welcome uh, uh, move, and, um, and as regulators, again, we need to be mindful of, of the risks uh, to stability and, and integrity, and, and if we try to aggressively uh, push for digital financial services in times of crisis, uh, we, without proper safeguards, you know, we need to be mindful of that. At the same time, um, Efforts to push the increase of use of digital financial services uh, should avoid increasing existing divides across users. So, of, of course, um, going hand in hand with uh, digital financial services is the work on financial literacy so that people can uh, meaningfully use uh, um, digital financial services. I'll, I'll just stop there for now, Michael. Let me ask a quick follow-up. My understanding was in Samoa, one of the mistakes you made early on was you didn't declare financial services and essential services. Is that, is that right? And I don't know how many countries also would look at that as a mistake that their country made, but did you declare financial services and essential services and did it stay open and what was the impact of that? Um, yes, that was, um, but with, with, with a previous crisis, it, was, it, never, it never was an issue. But uh, with uh, this one, during lockdowns, the financial services sector couldn't move around because you need to be authorized to move around to, yeah. you know, to provide the service. So that is one important thing that we find out that financial services should be part of essential services. In some, so, so that would be one of your recommendations to others yeah. is to make sure that that yes. doesn't get overlooked in the future. Let me go to Kenya, Deputy Governor Bjewe. Um we look at Kenya, I'm sure it's not a surprise to you, as a leader, particularly in the digital financial services, financial inclusion space. And so the assumption would be that you fared much better during the COVID crisis because you had the digital rails in place, because people were already used to it. Is that true? And if so, what lessons do you have from the Kenyan experience for your fellow regulators? Thank you um, for having us here today. And thank you to Jordan for this great occasion. Um, we're very happy to be here. Kenya is a country of 50 million people. And uh, right now we have 28 million active mobile users, um, which is about 84% of our population. And the gender gap is 4% between men and women. So really, um, digital services are a way of life. It's our DNA. In fact, um, I think in the original days in 2007 when we started this journey, what we found is it was the um, lower income group that were using digital services. But I think today it's everybody um, right to the top um, and all ages. Um, I've never really understood why you can find a lady of 80 in a village in Kenya quite happily sending money on digital services. There seems to be something. There was no 
literacy, there was no learning. They just appreciated the value of the service. Obviously, when COVID came, um, we realized the importance of the service. And I think the most important thing was that we were able to distribute to vulnerable groups within four days of announcing um, that COVID had arrived in Kenya. So this was an immediate benefit. Obviously, the population, we have a very high uptake of phones, um, of high, high, high quality phones. So you can reach everybody really in Kenya on, on the mobile. I think as we go forward, the lessons that we're learning is um, now that you've got this service, now that it's integrated well within the population, how do you use it to the best of its ability? People are using fancy terms of financial health, but I think this is very important. How do we make sure it's being used for good? And how do we make sure it's been improved for good, which includes affordability, accessibility, etc.? I think another thing that also concerns us a lot is what does this mean to us from the cyber perspective? And do we have the right infrastructure to protect this system that's become very important to our financial system? Thank you. Follow up a little bit on this question of cybersecurity, and, and, and I think a lot of, of the regulators in this room are very concerned about that because it's sort of the new consumer protection field. What, what are you experiencing? What have you seen in Kenya? Because people look to you as what they might expect to see later on, and how have you addressed them? I think, firstly, I'd like to say that it didn't come to us in cyber. Um, it came to us in a different way. Kenya is a fairly traditional country. Um, and gambling was not something that we did. But the uniqueness of this system and the ease in which you can use it, the gambling vice picked up very quickly. And so we had to bring in new laws um, and new taxes to make sure that we controlled. So it doesn't necessarily come in cyber. Cyber really comes down to um, a circle of trust because to share cyber data, to share this type of information, you need to get a circle of trust. And I think as a whole in the world, that journey is ongoing. But certainly at the Central Bank of Kenya, we, in, we integrate and relate and discuss with um, the security services of the government of Kenya. Um, it is interesting. I want to stay on this question of, of consumer protection because you raise this question of gambling is not really fraud, right? It's, not, uh, it's just something that uh, is a vice that you'd rather discourage. W how did you address that in Kenya when you, when you discovered online gambler, mobile phone gambling? Yeah, what we found is that uh, it, I think to begin with, you have to then decide where gambling sits. And I think what we agreed is that gambling sits with alcohol. So adults can do it um, in a structured way. Um, but we shouldn't encourage the, the youth um, to be involved in it. And so by in introducing the taxes and introducing certain controls within the mobile system, we're starting to control that. All right. that so aspect. primarily through by taxing it uh, a bit yeah. out of existence. Yeah. Interesting. Let me move to the private sector. Uh, Salim Ergos from MasterCard. I mean, a number um, of, of the panelists have talked about the importance of working with the private sector. You have a vantage point that goes beyond any particular country. So tell me what you've seen from the private sector in terms of how COVID impacted financial services and what lessons you might have for regulators. Thank you. First of all, uh, Thanks to AFI and Jordan for hosting us in beautiful Jordan. This is my first time, and I'll come back. Um, I think Salim, can I ask you to get a bit closer? Because I can barely hear you, so I'm sure. guessing they can can't hear you. Can you hear me now? So, yeah. As His Excellency Dr. Adel mentioned, sustainable and inclusive growth is very important, and it's our cornerstone for our strategy at MasterCard. Now, COVID has been terrible for all of us. Nobody, you know, for we suffered two to three years. It seems to be over, fingers crossed. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons during this time, and we also have ch seen a dramatic shift in, in the payments industry where we operated. We are one of the largest payments technology companies in the world. For example, e-commerce have grown 30 to, per, per, uh, 30 to 40 percent year on year and keeps growing. It was not so fast before COVID. It was already on the agenda, but it was not growing so fast. Sorry. Um, the cyber issues come along with that, uh, obviously. Um, we have seen in this region about 20% of people using less cash year on year. 
we, we are seeing 85% of people in, uh, in our survey, in the, in the payment survey that we, we have published, being aware of new digital um, methods of interacting uh, with, the, uh, with the broader uh, financial ecosystem. And in the examples we have seen in the Central Bank of Jordan case studies, this is exactly what's happening now, right? So we have obviously the younger segments adopting very quickly to these new trends and, and uh, other segments learning from the younger segments. And I think this trend is accelerating today. Um, that's probably one of the things that COVID has left us with. We also see behavior change. For example, people used to repay their bookings and everything to get advantage of lower costs, but now we are seeing people are unsure. They, they may book travel, but they want to pay in the hotel. They want to pay the destination because, you know, things can change last minute. Last, it, it, it has done uh, many times in the last couple of years. Um, but I think this digital and financial adoption, inclusion is now unstoppable. Um, humbly, I may suggest that we are working with a lot of governments. Um, we actually just have a project in Kenya to, to digitize the national parks uh, that would benefit uh, the SMEs as well as the government uh, to optimize those payments in those parks. As an example, um, we have many such examples. But I think in every country, the government is one of the largest um, businesses slash uh, collection and disbursement of flow centers. Government is a big center of flows, in and out. Um, I think given that this digitalization is happening, the first uh, humble suggestion I would uh, have is for the governments in this region to work with the private sector participants like ourselves to, con to uh, continue to address their own flows as well, inflows as well as outflows, disbursements. Just one example, recently Pakistan had terrible floods. Uh, unfortunately, many people lost their uh, lives and livelihoods. Within a couple of days, we could put a platform working with the government that collects uh, funds to be dispersed to those impacted societies, and this happened very fast. This happened with local partners, with local fintechs. Um, we are just really an orchestrator. We are not even playing a major role. But I think um, in such a use case or in other use cases where government is actually in the middle of transaction, for example, transit, uh, which usually in this region belongs to the government entities, utilities. We would like to work uh, with you to kind of continue in this digitalization journey in these big uh, uh, sectors. The second one, again humbly, is there are a number of policy implications of this new world. Uh, obviously, um, cyber is one aspect. Protection of the ecosystem is another aspect. We are very interested in uh, developing policies together with the government entities, municipalities, to ensure that the ecosystem grows healthily. Um, and as more people are included into the financial ecosystem, that they can also benefit from it. It's not a one-off. It is sustainable in the sense that there's a behavior embedded into that inclusion, uh, working together uh, on a safe, secure manner so that trust can be built over a period of time. And this becomes really sustainable. Uh, for all the participants in ecosystem. Thank you. So the, the two messages for regulators, one is you are active participants in the digital system by G2P payments and uh, P2G payments. Uh, you can actually uh, induce, you know, take up of the digital rails. The second, if I understood, was something a little bit less definitive, more about let's all talk together about cybersecurity. But I want to talk to you a bit more about that. What, I, you know, I could argue if I'm using MasterCard as my primary rails for you know, payments, it's your responsibility to deal with the cybersecurity, not necessarily mine. How do you, how do you view that, that approach in terms of primary responsibility for cybersecurity? I think um, we as an organization, first of all, have a lot of learnings from this space, being a target for bad actors on a daily basis. Uh, that's the reality. Uh, that's the reality of our because, of, again, we have about 3 billion cardholders globally processing trillions of transactions. You can imagine, uh, we, even before COVID, we were uh, uh, watching out of, uh, creating all of awareness of this space. 
I think the responsibility is in, uh, with us, with the government entities, with policymakers, to um, watch the space, identify, work, uh, utilize the tools that we already have to identify these bad actors and to basically go after them. So, I mean, it's, it's actually quite uh, straightforward. And the tools are available. It's continuously being developed. And many companies like ourselves are embedding these tools into the payment system automatically. So uh, in the background, you know, anecdotally, I just want to say something. When I, when I my first jobs uh, in a large bank, we, the head of data center was presenting, and the gentleman who was head of the region that said, we don't want to hear from you. And everybody was shocked, like, what do we want? We want to hear from your presentation, but you need to operate so smoothly. We should not know that you exist in the sense that, right? So we are trying to ensure that all these, let's say, negativity, let's say, uh, the safety is embedded so much into the payment transaction. You don't really hear these uh, negativities, There's these threats, and we shield the system from all these threats. That's, uh, I guess, a good way of addressing it. Thank you. Let me move to, to Laura uh, from ADA in Luxembourg. You've done uh, a lot of research in the microfinance space over very many years. Um, what, from your perspective, um, changed with COVID, and what lessons would you have for regulators in the room? Can you? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you uh, for the, the invitation. It's a privilege and an honor for me to be here in face of this uh, strategic and uh, political audience. I'm used to work in the field in a bottom-up approach, and uh, I think that one of the lessons learned, as um, the speaker uh, previously mentioned, is this uh, public-private partnership that is one of the key messages and the key uh, lessons learned during the pandemic, because uh, all of us cooperated to uh, promote and to save uh, also the financial inclusion system. Um, one, uh, yes, despite all the difficulties and the sufferings, as uh, uh, it has been mentioned this morning, um, we learned a lot from pandemic. And if I have to choose one key insight from this uh, learning, uh, I would choose the importance of savings uh, for vulnerable people. Um, we made, uh, we as in other support microfinance sector uh, as part of the inclusive finance sector. So we um, support with financing and also with capacity building um, financial service providers that uh, have as clients the most vulnerable people. And we realized with our study into 20, 2020 and 2021, studies that we um, realized with uh, surveys to the direct uh, final customer, the clients of the final clients, the beneficiaries of these microfinance institutions. And 80%, 70 to 80% of the people that were interviewed um, considered the savings as the first action, uh, the first line of defense during the pandemic. And I think this is uh, an evidence today, but it is really important for the resilience of vulnerable people in several countries. And um, a message maybe for the regulator is the fact that there are not only banks that uh, are able to provide savings products uh, to uh, vulnerable people, but there are also other kind of um, financial service providers, specialized one, like for example, SACOS that are close and in a proximity with uh, uh, vulnerable people, uh, FinTechs as well that can uh, improve their way to reach uh, vulnerable people in order to having access and to use uh, adapted uh, savings products. Um, yeah, if I, and another, uh, another um, so point is really to help microfinance institutions to be reinforced and to be more solid because during the pandemic this was the, the, the change and what changed actually the sector in financial inclusion for us.
I want to go back um, to a bigger question of sort of going forward. We still have very vulnerable populations. Um, who are those vulnerable populations in your countries, and what are you going to do to sort of address those populations? We typically talk about women, we typically talk about the rural, we talk about youth. Um, how does it work in your country, Governor Inari? Let me start um, with you, uh, just to hear a little bit, because you, you say, look, women are not your issue, the gender gap is 2%, and that's actually men who are less included than women. So women is not uh, uh, something you focus on, but who do you focus on, and how do you address it? Um, thank you, Michael. Well, there are competing um, uh, priorities, um, but gender, uh, gender is not a concern. Uh, it's not a burning concern. I uh, just want to state some statistics. We did our financial services demand side survey in 2015, and it shows that Samoan women are faring well in financial services, uh, that there is a high proportion of women who are financially included uh, in comparison to men. 66% of adults have some form of financial products and services, and in terms of gender breakdown, there are 40% of women who have a bank account when compared to 38% of men. Similarly, 13% of women also use other formal financial services in comparison to 11% of men, and 17% of women access informal financial services in comparison to 12% of men. So, if anything, the statistics are very telling that we should empower men in my country. But, uh, so while gender is not a, a burning... <laughs> while gender is not a burning concern, but uh, we keep an eye on it to ensure that it doesn't deteriorate further. So, um, digitization is a cross-cutting uh, theme across all priorities and goals, but as a small island state, we are prone to natural disasters and climate resilience is paramount to our survival and, and many livelihoods. And how far, I mean, climate, of course, everyone is talking about climate right now. Um, but what, what, what exactly are you, are you doing? What are you thinking about in terms of how you address climate change in, in the context of your country, Governor? Um, there is um, uh, work uh, in the region that um, uh, we hope uh, to pick up on. It's the inclusive green finance and, uh, and also the work in the region in the insurance space. So our journey in uh, inclusive green finance is still at its early stages and uh, uh, in promoting that uh, as regulators uh, we need to assess and integrate climate related risks as part of our supervisory framework. Thank you. Let's go to, to Jordan. Uh, who are your vulnerable populations in Jordan, and how are you, how are you targeting reaching them? Uh, thank you so much. I think it's a very good question. Um, and really, before launching the uh, financial inclusion strategy in 2017, we conducted a diagnostic study in order to uh, be able to put our priorities and to identify the most vulnerable groups in the country in order to be able to serve them and to provide them with uh, fair and responsible uh, financial services. I think in Jordan still uh, uh, youth and women uh, are vulnerable groups. Who, who and women? Women and somebody? Rural women? What did you say? I'm sorry. Yes. The, rural women. Uh, yes, okay. especially when we're talking about women in rural areas. Uh, still there is a gap in uh, providing the financial services for, to this segment. Uh, youth, especially the entrepreneurs that uh, would like to create their own business. I think also this is a vulnerable group that we have uh, to focus uh, on um, and I think uh, uh, MSMEs in general, and yani okay, the SME sector in Jordan represents more than 95% of the uh, companies operating in Jordan, but I think still a high financing gap. We have to work on it. Okay, we made uh, great progress in, in this regard, but at the same time, we need to, to do more. 
especially by providing capacity building programs and technical assistance to provide them with the skills needed how to start the business, how to develop the business, how to expand it, how to be bankable, how to meet the requirements of banks and financial institutions. That's why when we are talking about women, youth, especially in the rural areas, and SME, SMEs are still vulnerable groups, and uh, a lot of progress and efforts have been made in Jordan, but I think through the implementation uh, of the new strategy, now we are working a new financial inclusion strategy, and uh, this strategy also put a very well-defined priorities with uh, clear uh, measures and actions to be taken to uh, improve financial inclusion to the uh, vulnerable groups, especially uh, through investing more and more in the financial technology. Because financial technology and digital financial services enable us to reach out the vulnerable groups, especially in the uh, remote uh, areas. So since the implementation of the first strategy, we noticed a good progress in this regard, uh, but now we are working a new strategy, and uh, uh, under the new strategy, we will make sure to improve financial uh, 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 inclusion for the vulnerable groups. Okay. Thank you. Interesting, you, you point to youth. Um, I know the MasterCard Foundation's sole um, strategy is around youth in Africa, but I know the Arab world also probably has a youth bulge that might, uh, might be, need to be addressed. I want to I go to Kenya, and I, I purposely kept you last, Deputy Governor Bajewe, in, in, for this question, because some might argue, and even as you've pointed out, your numbers are very good. And some might say your, your issue is not inclusion anymore. You know, it's, it's really not about, you know, getting people access. You've kind of got them the access. You're working on the quality. You're way ahead of many of your colleagues, not just in Africa, but even in the United States. I remember a friend of mine who worked with the U.S. government said, yes, at the beginning of COVID, we looked at Kenya to see what they were doing because we were not as set up as Kenya was. Is Kenya moving to sort of a post-inclusion world? Is your agenda more on what our colleague from Jordan mentioned, more of the macroeconomic, understanding the bigger picture? How are you, how are you viewing this given Kenya's advanced stages of inclusion? Um, yeah, I think that, um, as I say, we've, we've, we've ticked the box of access. Um, if you've got 28 million active users on a 50 million population of a large number of youth, in that population, then you've ticked the box of access. But access doesn't, it's not the end of the story. Because then you're talking about how it's being used and how successful it's being used and how fairly it's being used. Um, I wanted actually to get on to the, the, the green agenda because I think that's where um, we're really looking very seriously at the moment. You know, all of this is an infrastructure. When you're talking geopolitics, when you're talking about the climate, when you're talking about resilience or digitization, it's all connected. And you have to have the whole infrastructure in place for the success of the digitization to continue. For example, if, if a woman is hit by, by some kind of climate event, then her digitization is also impacted. Her financial and her economic um, security is also impacted. So in Kenya, we've been working hard to put together this whole infrastructure. And to be honest, I didn't understand how well it had been put together until I did my work for, for this session because I wanted to be clear. Um, but in our constitution, we have written into that the Paris Agreement. So we have a clause in our constitution about the necessity to be a green nation. We have um, a 30 percent reduction in our emissions by 2030 objective. Um, we have a Climate Change Act 2016 written into our law and now being implemented. We have renewable energy. Currently we're 86 percent renewable and 90 percent renewable on electricity. Um, and this is mainly through geothermal. We're the eighth largest geothermal producer in the world um, today. I think that 7.4% of our country's forest covered, and we've also banned plastic bags in 2017. I noticed, um, you know, when you go to an airport now, and in fact I have to say that we followed Rwanda, they were the first to ban 
um, the plastic bags. And if you go to an airport today and you see people removing plastic bags from their shopping, they're going to East Africa um, because we have banned them. You're not allowed them. It's illegal to have a plastic bag. When we look at the financial sector, what have we done? Climate risk is built into our internal capital adequacy and assessment processes. So now banks have to, when they give us their reports, they have to report on climate risk. Um, Kenya's sovereign green bond was launched. I have to say, as a small thing, it's, it's, not a big, it's not a big deal, but that was launched in 2014. We've also, our Bankers Association has now uh, financial guiding principles, and the Central Bank of Kenya also released a guidance paper on this matter. But I think I want to say something else, which I think is equally important. When I look at the data around carbon emissions, what I see in... Where I got this data from is something called Our World in Data, 2019. Africa's emissions are 3.8%. If Kenya does everything, what kind of impact can it have? And therefore, we have to ask the rest of the world, what are you doing? Thank you. I, I feel very awkward as an American um, <laughs> on this panel, so I will, I will pass on your message. But uh, as you know, we have our own issues there, so I might be moving to Kenya soon. Um, Salim, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, from your perspective, as how you view either this climate question, which I'm, I, I'm curious about because it's, it's still, to me, a bit of a, a vague sort of question around what the role of financial services are, but, or on the vulnerable populations question, what are you seeing from a private sector perspective? First of all, again, uh, as, a, as our core business is payments technology, we have in the last years, five years or so, taken this technology and started to develop certain platforms that we can uh, utilize the learnings from that and uh, in the agriculture sector, in the healthcare sector, and in the supply chain sector. Just three examples, and then I can also maybe talk a little bit about the... Um, I think for, uh, for the agriculture sector, which is a very important sector, obviously there are a lot of small farmers, and uh, we developed a product called FarmPass that is basically a marketplace uh, for small farmers to connect with each other, because if somebody is not digitally and financially included, you can then only sell in person, right? If somebody is just basically uh, sees you or somehow knows you beforehand, then it's a limited uh, marketplace. But digital marketplaces gives a much broader uh, domestic or international marketplace to, uh, to anyone. And in, in the sense that we have launched this program in India, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, there are now one million small farmers on this. And we also found out that they, before, they had only 3% access to credit, and now we are bringing banking partners to make available certain credits uh, uh, to, to these small farmers to grow their business. So that's one. The other one is uh, what we call the wellness pass, which is basically, even I don't have uh, digital vaccination passes. I think probably none of us have here. So we have developed a digital vaccination pass. It has nothing to do with payments, but using the technology in payments to be able to include uh, digitally, the vaccination records of kids in various countries. This one we are um, uh, piloting in Mauritania, um, and I think it's a very nice way of digitally including, including uh, citizens in a very meaningful manner because there's follow ups on vaccinations, uh, you know, the dates are reminded. You know, that, that's a good thing to, uh, to take from the payment space and to expand to other spaces. And the third one uh, is actually piloted in Kenya with partnership with Unilever and KCB, where Unilever's distribution ne network, small uh, shops, can now digitally see their, uh, there's a connection between them and their supplier uh, for their supply chain. So they can digitize it. And then again, a bank can step in and uh, provide credit to successful businesses. Uh, because if there is no access to credit, the large companies all have access to credit and they have everything, but when it comes to smaller uh, players, that get, gets more difficult because their business is not 
transparent to the banking sector. So we are just trying to make those connections. Some examples from what we are trying to achieve on other sectors, learning uh, from our learnings. In terms of the uh, MasterCard, we definitely have sustainability goals as well, but maybe a small example of what I can, before the pandemic, I was meeting with a, with a, a very honorable minister from, from Egypt actually, and she told me, Selim, you know, our um, pensions most of the time are in person, so you have to come to a branch, collect it in person, and that's not very good for the older generation because they have to travel, they have to use the car, it's hot, it's a hot country, and uh, health conditions. So we are, we are working, for example, to digitize those interactions. Um, and even that has a green impact because you want to go and drive for uh, productive means, but you don't want to drive just to make a payment or collect a payment from somewhere. So I think that reduces actually emissions. If we uh, use transport less and use it more for uh, really required uh, actions that we take. So it's just one uh, example of how industries are mingled and what we do on the payment space can impact uh, the environment also. So uh, just one example I wanted to mention. Thank you, Laura. From your perspective, I mean, you have a global perspective on this. How do you decide which vulnerable group you want to target and why? It was a hard choice to do one because there are several segments of vulnerable people that are, are worthy. Uh, but we choose young entrepreneurship um, because uh, young entrepreneurs are, um, have a strong impact on uh, to, to address unemployment, to address migration problems. And there is a strong gap between supply and demand of financial services for young for young people. Uh, actually, financial service providers uh, don't understand the needs of young entrepreneurs uh, because they perceive that uh, too risky. Uh, they move too much, too innovative, uh, using too much technologies. And uh, so um, this risk perception uh, reduces the offer of specific and adapted uh, financial services. Um, so what, is, uh, what we are doing is really to reinforce uh, the private sector uh, providing and participating to uh, do risking uh, financial schemes like guarantee schemes, for example, or um, national funds that can also provide um, concessional uh, loans, for example, that can help starting uh, a business for, from uh, the perspective of uh, young entrepreneurs. Um, I have to say also that uh, financing is not the only need that uh, have young entrepreneurs. Uh, they also need, due to the um, short period that are active in the business uh, market, they need also um, business skills, they need uh, financial education, and uh, I was uh, surprised and also happy to see for the uh, Global Youth Award that will be awarded uh, tomorrow, uh, a lot of applications that uh, um, demonstrate that you, uh, uh, several countries, uh, were so committed in providing these facilities to young entrepreneurs, young people in general, and started uh, also financial education programs. And we have seen in our research, because we work in several countries, particularly in Africa, that when a um, young entrepreneur started very early understanding uh, financial issues, financial matters, are even more able to um, succeed in their, in their business at the early stage as well. And uh, in some cases, we provide uh, trainings and capacity buildings uh, during all the period of the first loan, and then this, uh, they became bankable uh, from the former sector. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, um, I, I wanted to circle back on this question of climate. I'm sorry for going back and forth, but I realized we hadn't heard from Jordan. We heard from our two other regulators uh, on climate. And I'm just wondering, you know, it's no secret that Jordan is in a desert that desert is actually encroaching on much of your fertile land. So climate is clearly an issue for you here. 
What's the role of the central bank in addressing these climate issues? Have you thought about that at all? Do you have a plan? Um, climate change. Thank you so much. I think this issue is very important. Uh, now we notice that uh, such type of risks are evolving over the web. So uh, strengthening the climate risk management is one of the most important issues here in Jordan. And now we are working on developing a green finance strategy. The green finance strategy will take into consideration two sides, risks and opportunities. Risks when it comes to strengthening the risk management, when it comes to the, uh, climate change related financial risks, how the banking sector and the financial sector can manage such type of risks, how to be able to incorporate them in their credit policies, in their investment policies, in their governance as a whole. So this is a very important issue. At the same time, we have to enhance the uh, green finance. So this is the, uh, the opportunity side. So taking into consideration the risk side and opportunity side is, is very important. Now we are uh, working uh, with the World Bank to develop a comprehensive a green finance uh, strategy and to conduct something called the climate risk assessment. The climate risk assessment is very important for the country because it identified what uh, the most important types of risks that we have to focus on. We have the fiscal risk and we have the transition risk. So this is a very important, but I think one of the most important challenges in this regard is the availability of data. So filling the data gaps regarding the climate risk management and the green finance activities is one of the most important milestones under our planned uh, strategy. Uh, uh, this issue, I think, should be also in line with the national goals and should be a part of the big umbrella that we are working on as a financial inclusion strategy. So the overlap and the integration uh, between green finance and uh, financial inclusion is very important to be taken in a way to achieve our goals and to uh, maintain the sustainability because uh, provide the, the digital financial services and the financial services as a whole is very important, but how to ensure the sustainability, how to ensure the responsible and sustainable finance, I think this is the big challenge that all the countries has to uh, work on. Thank you. I, I, do, I think we have enough time to take questions from the audience, if there is any. Um, but while you think about, oh, uh, there is one. Um, hold on to that. We'll get to you in just a moment. If, you, if, if, uh, if others of you uh, want to ask, please, please prepare your questions. But before we get to the audience, I did want to ask just a quick question of the panelists about the role of AFI. And you know, what, going forward, what do you think is, is AFI's key role in, in helping you address some of the challenges you've identified? And let's start with Jordan. Uh, yani, I think uh, yani, the role of the central bank uh, also uh, in collaboration with the financial sector and the government and the private sector as a whole uh, really is to have a, a, a very clear and uh, well-defined policies and measures to deal with the challenges. Yani, for example, in Jordan in uh, 2012, we uh, started focusing on financial inclusion and we started by identifying the most important challenges that we are facing. That's why identifying the challenges in a scientific way, this is the first step. After that, how to, to have collective efforts between the public sector and the private sector to deal with uh, the challenges for advancing and improving financial uh, inclusion. I think having uh, the strategies and policies is very important, but at the same time, the implementation, how to monitor the implementation, how to have a very comprehensive and well-defined monitoring and evaluation. This is very important to, to have smart goals, to have uh, well-defined uh, KPIs in order uh, to have uh, some uh, building of databases that uh, maybe help you in uh, monitoring the, and evaluating the, the implementation of the strategy. Good. And Governor Inari, and, uh, how do you view AFI's role going forward? 
Well, at the very least, there is um, great knowledge sharing and learning that's already taking place uh, in the Alliance through uh, its public-private dialogues, the capacity building events, and knowledge exchange programs. But uh, I would like to see them more focus on, on implementation. We have a lot of knowledge products, but we want to, to, to see that. So basically, the knowledge products are not enough. You, you need to be able to take that and actually ad apply it and understand from it. Uh, very important. Um, uh, Deputy Governor Bjewe, uh, your, your, your views on AFI. I think uh, it needs to be a convener of events like this so that we can share ideas and get to know each other and understand each other. I think it needs to create a platform that can evaluate and identify risk um, to financial inclusion. And that platform also needs to coordinate the responses to those risks, to make sure that we're mitigating those risks. And most importantly, we should be a voice of the unheard or poorly heard at the International Developed Institution Forums and be a voice, a very loud voice for public good. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Alfred would be very happy to hear that. I think one of his primary motivations in, in uh, founding the AFI network was to give a voice to those who hadn't been uh, particularly heard. So I, I think they've been very successful, but of course uh, I leave that to the members to, to decide. Let's move to the audience. I saw there was a question over there. If you could please identify yourself and if, you, if there's somebody in particular that you're directing the question to, please, uh, please clarify. Thank you. Uh, Summer from the Central Bank of Pakistan. And my, my question is to the three regulators, uh, the governors and, and deputy governors. Uh, when, when the first, and that's related to the subject. When the first round of uh, COVID, you see, hit the world, the, the stimulus that you have in your tool toolkit was liquidity that you injected. Inflation rose, and you had to raise the policy rate. And that hurt, you see, those who are the marginal sectors. Now, my question is, God forbid, if the second round hits again, what toolkit would be available with you? Thank you. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I fully understood. If a second round, if a second... Yeah, then... Another disaster comes on top of a disaster. No, no, I, I'm saying if the second round of the COVID comes again, then the problem is that then in order to save the businesses, now you cannot inject liquidity because you have seen the, the consequences of that. So then what other tools do you have the central banks have in their toolkit to address so that the business can also continue and at the same time you don't create a situation where the inflation goes so up and and policy rate has to be raised and then these sectors are again going to be more marginalized thank you i think there's very few times when you can be blessed by not having the wealth that other nations have I think this is one of the times, because if we look and we see what's happening now in America, in Britain, Europe, there's pledges for more intervention. Um, so the outcomes of that will be revealed as time goes by. And obviously, if I speak for Kenya, we never had the extent of intervention. We didn't have the capacity. So we never had the extent of interventions. So we still have um, some powder in our gun if we need it. Thank you. Either of you want to take on that question? No. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, one way in the corner there. You could please identify yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Stephen from Central Bank of Ghana. My question goes to the Deputy Governor from Kenya. I think respectively, your last submission really caught my attention on the, um, the statement you made that you've asked the banks to do the climate assessment under the Pillar 2, which is the ICAP. Um, my question is that, you know, within Africa, data is a big issue. So what would be your approach? Do you want the banks to focus only on maybe the governance issues and strategy, maybe risk management, or you want them to focus on quantitative. It's very important for me because to hear this from the high level, I do really appreciate it. So I just wanted if you can really give a bit of um, uh, maybe more detail a bit. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you very much. We gave uh, a format.
that that we would like to be filled so that there was standardization across the banks in the way that they address it. And we've also allowed them time. We've given them over a year and a half to do it. I think their time ran out in June of this year so that they had time to work with their auditors who also could assist them. We've done something else which is still at an initial stage. We've introduced at the central bank an enterprise data warehouse which is a collection of all data coming in from our financial sector. So they'll also be able to use that. So what I would say is as time goes by, the quality of that should increase as this data and the accuracy of that data improves. Thank you. Uh, can I follow up on that? Because this question of climate risk assessment, I think, is a, a common one among many of the people here. And I know our colleague from Jordan mentioned it. Can you give us a flavor about what exactly you're asking them to report on? For example, each one of their loans, what is the risk that climate would impact the repayment, or is it more than that? Um, it's, there's different classifications in, in, in these risks assessments. And obviously in Kenya we have a certain advantage because we're not a mineral oriented country. Um, so, in, in many countries, that becomes an issue when you're talking about the extractive industry, which we don't have. But what we're looking at more is the weather, um, particularly in the farming sector, and what are the impacts then that follow through if you get these events happening, and how do you then classify them, and what provisioning have you put in place to protect yourself should one of these events it's, it's quite technical, but, but, but that's the sense of it. Uh, and, but just to understand that, I mean, this is one of our questions with data that we get all the time, whether it's climate related or not. It's okay, you get the data, but what do you do with it? So if I understood correctly, you get that data and you say, are you provisioning correctly? That's your solution as provision. Is there, is there something else that you do with that data? Do you take more of a global view about the sector as a whole? N not really, not at this stage. And I think this is what was being asked by the Bank of Ghana because we're still at that early stage. We're following the guidelines that have come from BIS, which is at this stage, collect your data, start to see what provisioning is being put, is the capital adequate for, for what's required for that business? And if they're going to get into more of that business, they need to be warned that there needs to be more capital to meet the risk that goes with that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on climate risk assessment? Anyone want to comment on that? Yeah, Laura, yeah? <laughs> Maybe because this is, um, I think that you, you talked about the role of AFI. I think that is really important, the work that the Green Financial Inclusion Group has done. And in particular, there is a role also of harmonization. And when we talk about green finance, I think that taxonomy is really key because taxonomy clarify the definition of what we are talking about when we talk about green finance, what are the specific financial, green financial products. And there is a very different level of taxonomy today in different countries. In particular, we have seen in uh, South Asian countries where we started a new program um, funded by the uh, German government in order to improve um, community resilience through financial inclusion. Um, and we had uh, this framework that is legal framework that is really different country to country. And there are some countries that are uh, best in class that already did uh, this work, uh, but others that there are still in improving and ongoing work. And yeah. this harmonization is really important. Thank you. Yes, from Jordan. Uh, thank you. I think also when it comes to green finance and the climate risk management, it's, it's very important to have some sort of stress testing in this regard in order to uh, measure the ability of banks and financial institutions to withstand such type of risks. So uh, stress testing is very important in the climate risk management. Uh, also to have something comprehensive regarding ESG, mm. envir environmental, social, governance, all these guidelines are very important to, to be used to evaluate the borrower, to evaluate the client, to evaluate the sustainability of the project and the ability of the bank and financial institutions to, to finance uh, such uh, projects. So I think we have to, to when we are talking, talking about financial inclusion and its relation to the climate risk management and green finance, we have to use something 
related to the holistic or comprehensive approach. Uh, something we, we, we have something called ICEP. ICEP, it's uh, inclusion, stability, integrity, protection. So all these elements, when come together, I think we can reach to, to something sustainable and in line with the national development goals. I, just for the record, um, ICEP was established and created by CGAP, and I did not pay you to, to mention that, but it was a, <laughs> it, it was a, a, a very powerful tool, and I, uh, I, think it's a, I think an important one, and I'm happy to hear that, uh, that you're still uh, using that framework. I think we have a quite time for one more question in the back. Is that, or I see a couple. Maybe if we can get some quick questions. Oh, now, now the hands are popping up. Okay, <laughs> let's start in the back there. I think that was the first one. Could you identify yourself, please? Uh, yes, I'm Johan Stone from UNCAP, uh, project director and MDFI. I'm active in Kenya, Israel, Rwanda, Uganda, and Nigeria. Um, so we've heard about the top-down approach to uh, create resilient uh, interventions and packages uh, for adaptation of plant risks on uh, human Uh, collecting data from all the entrepreneurs that apply, all the small businesses, SMEs that apply, and we assess their um, status of environmental awareness to um, know how to support them best in preparing them for such uh, cases. So um, we have to understand how do they view climate resilience, uh, how do they understand that? Are they able to save inventory, save cash reserves for such situations that um, when there is uh, no capacity from banks or other institutions to support them, that they have some resilience as uh, the groundwork to overcome such uh, situations. So understanding what the bottom-up need is and the bottom-up uh, awareness is of such events is also a um, basic pillar on building resilience uh, um, yeah, at the bottom. Th thank you, but that, I understand that was not really a question to the... The, the, the question is, uh, um, are there available education packages to, or not just uh, funds packages or intervention packages, but also preparing uh, the SMEs for such cases, making them aware of possible risk events uh, in the future. Okay. So any, any effort about equipping some of these clients uh, to deal with what might come? Anyone want to comment on that? Laura, yeah? Yeah, yeah. we did in several programs. We provide, uh, we, we act with an uh, holistic approach in the sense that we start working with communities um, and providing, um, I don't want to say training, but information and climate education to communities that are not always aware on their risk and on their capacity to face those risks linked to the climate change um, effects. And so there are in several programs, but there are most um, in, embedded in uh, um, programs that are granted from uh, different um, DFIs or um, governments is our experience. Thank you. Okay, I, I, okay, I see uh, we've got two more minutes and I saw there was a very eager hand right there in the center. I don't know how we're going to get her a microphone though. Oh, sorry, more eager hand. She's already... <laughs> okay, bear with me, we'll get to you. Two, two final questions. And if, you, if we could, just in the interest of time, it would be as brief as you can. Yeah, thank you. Mine is really specific. It's from a central bank of El Salvador, and it's to Samoa or Jordan. And it's how do you plan to, to or how are you, plan, are, are you mixing or planning to mix the inclusive, uh, the development of the, inclus the financial inclusion with the adaptation to climate change? And we ask because in El Salvador, because of our, our, of our geographic location, we are also very exposed to, to climate change. And um, if there is any specific financial products that you are developing or plan to develop. Thank you. That was to Jordan? 
Jordan or Jordan. Samoa. Okay. Thank and, you. And sorry, before we jump into that, let me just take that final uh, the final question, and then maybe we can answer both uh, to conclude. Uh, there was a, a young woman. Yes. Uh, it's Nezra from the Central Bank of Morocco. My question is to all Central Bankers. Um, actually, in our developing countries, we are facing a double inequality, double e climate inequality, because we are highly vulnerable, but also we have less, less adaptive capacities and less abilities to really cope with climate-related disasters. So my question, briefly, is how, as a central bank, can we make sure uh, that government bodies and policy, public policies also take into consideration climate-related issues in a balanced way with uh, social and economic priorities, especially that we are having uh, and struggling with other competing priorities in social services, health and education uh, access. Thank you. I wish those were simpler questions to conclude. <laughs> Let me, let me, I think we already talked about climate, but, but I think the, the, the one part from our, from our colleague from El Salvador that I thought was interesting was what specifically, you know, can she start thinking about? Do you have specific ideas uh, for her? And then we can take uh, the other question from Morocco as, as you see fit. Anyone want to take those on? I know it's a bit daunting. Governor Inari is looking at me like, no, no. <laughs> Please don't call on me. <laughs> Anyone? All right. OK. With your permission, let me, we can take some of those questions in the hallways during the break afterwards. Um, I, I, Aban, I, I'm losing control here. Do we need to cut? OK. Um, I appreciate that there's a lot more questions. We just don't have enough time to take them. Uh, but as I always say, this is just the beginning of a conversation. It's not the end of a conversation. One of the beauties about being off mute is that we can continue these conversations over meals, uh, over coffee, uh, and you can make the connections that you need. I'm sure everybody here is not very busy. They'd love to talk to you um, and uh, give you any advice that they, that they have. So join me in thanking our, our colleagues on the panel. Before we excuse the panel, ladies and gentlemen, can we also thank Michael Tarazi for moderating this session on financial inclusion in the post-pandemic world. Let's give him another big round of applause to our panelists and to our moderator. Thank you all sincerely. We'll excuse them from the, uh, from the stage now as we move on to our next session. Ladies and gentlemen, we still have another session to, um, to get through before we get to lunch. And while I have your attention, I just want to mention here that, um, you know, in order for us to be able to have very relevant uh, discussions and riveting discussions, we need to hear from you. So we'd like to have your feedback um, on the session. And uh, you can see up on the screen, We've put up where you can do the evaluation. The evaluation platform, of course, is on the event app. And once you get to the app, you go to schedule and add the session. So you can go to the schedule now, add the session that we just had, okay? Plenary 2, financial inclusion in the post-pandemic world, emerging policy priorities and pathways. We invite you to do that now, ladies and gentlemen. It'd be great to get your feedback as we move through the entire program, and also so that you don't forget, all right? You add the session, after which is on the agenda, then you provide us with your feedback on the session you have attended using the survey feature. And that's right there, clearly marked with a blue arrow. Go to that. So you have a few minutes to do that, right? Just before we move on to the um, final session before lunch. Again, we'd love to hear from you so we can, uh, you know, get your feedback on other relevant topics that we can do for uh, the next uh, forum. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. We now have another part, a very special program to get through, and it is the launch of the South Asia Region Financial Inclusion Initiative, SAFI. And for this, I first draw your attention to the screen for a video presentation.
South Asia has made important strides over the past decade in accelerating financial inclusion backed by country-level financial inclusion strategies, providing access to finance to over 40% of the region's population in 2021 up to 23% in 2011. Countries in South Asia, supported by AFI, are implementing these strategies to move together towards a common goal of advancing financial inclusion in the region. To build on the valuable work being done in the region, regulators in South Asia have embraced digital transformation and digital financial inclusion as important solutions to drive an inclusive and sustainable recovery from the pandemic. The latest Findex data is also showing digital financial services have some of the greatest potential for increasing women's financial inclusion. But tough challenges remain. Over 150 million adults continue to lack access to formal financial institutions. The gender gap in access to finance continues to remain higher in South Asia and the region gets disproportionately impacted because of the adverse effects of climate change. AFI South Asian members are looking to seize the opportunities amidst these challenges and are taking action through a wide range of policies to accelerate financial inclusion for all and eliminate inequity by addressing the local and unique challenges in the region. To continue improving policies that get results with an enhanced regional focus, AFI South Asian members have identified six key priorities. Digital financial services, financing of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, reducing the gender gap, inclusive green finance, financial inclusion data and consumer protection and financial education and literacy. These priorities will be implemented through five platforms as part of a new South Asia Region Financial Inclusion Initiative, SARFI, which will help boost collaborations, share experiences and aim to increase financial inclusion. Each member institution taking part in SARFI wants to make a positive difference in the lives of its people. This initiative will therefore drive change by supporting member institutions in facilitating the implementation of smart and practical policies through peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and global and regional best practices while also addressing the inclusion of vulnerable population such as women, youth, the elderly and rural remote populations leaving no one behind. Specific AFI programs and services will be tailored to SARFI, improving collaborations and understanding how useful experiences can address local and regional priorities, resulting in increased access and use of financial services, benefiting those who need them the most. Officially launching at the 2022 Global Policy Forum, members of SARFI are moving forward together towards a resilient, inclusive and sustainable future. SARFI will build on the important achievements of AFI South Asian members over the last decade by acting as a catalyst, reaching those who remain unbanked or underbanked, particularly women, and creating additional pathways to fulfill its simple mission and purpose to improve lives and make financial security and inclusion a reality for all across South Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, yesterday marked another historic occasion for our colleagues, uh, the Safi colleagues. So let's give them another big round of applause, please. I'd like to uh, invite to come up on stage for his remarks, Dr. Hanig, the AFI Executive Director. Let's uh, make him feel welcome again. Thank you very much and um, yeah governors and deputy governors and delegates from <clears throat> all the institutions here ladies and gentlemen yeah this is uh, again a very special moment for us as uh, we are here together to launch the uh, sixth regional initiative within the AFI network on South Asia the South Asia region financial inclusion initiative in short SAFI now this is indeed um, one region that we were not 
able uh, to cover so far with a regional um, activity of this kind. But our, um, <clears throat> I should say that our South Asian members have uh, really taken their financial inclusion mandate very seriously over the past decade and have implemented um, many policies to ensure continued access for the unbanked and the underbanked. And actually, when you look at the FINDEX data, it's very impressive you know, to see that uh, in South Asia, um, the level of financial inclusion for adults has actually increased from 23% um, in 2011 to 40% now in 2021. So I think that's quite a, quite a move, right? Now, in the past years, um, I mean, one could say, in spite of the damage caused by the pandemic, or actually because of the pandemic, regulatory bodies in the region have really embraced digital transformation as, a, as, as an essential solution uh, to the problem of creating a resilient, inclusive, and sustainable recovery. And while we have seen a lot of innovation in the region, like always being a cradle of innovation, there are still some very severe challenges that um, I just would like to highlight. We have still over 150 million um, unbanked people in the South Asia region. So you see how populous the region is. Uh, and we also do see that the gender gap continues to be higher than elsewhere, um, higher than the global average. Um, the region also does get disproportionately impacted because of the effects of the climate change. So, um, Safi, I think, has the challenge now and will address um, these issues uh, by attempting uh, to move forward on a regional initiative that hopes to play a very catalytic role uh, in furthering regional financial inclusion goals. And uh, as you could see in this uh, video just now, uh, members have already identified their priorities, uh, such as financing for micro, small and medium enterprises, the MSME, the digital financial services, gender inclusive finance, inclusive green finance, consumer protection, financial literacy, and um, also addressing inclusion for vulnerable populations, such as the youth, the elderly, and the rural populations, with this goal of leaving no one behind. The priorities will be implemented through the SAFI, which uh, is an initiative that will hopefully help to boost the collaborations, share experiences, and aim to increase financial inclusion um, to reach the unbanked and underbanked in the region. Um, my last word is just a call. I would like to invite the larger AFI community, not only members, but also our partners, donors, and the other stakeholders in this room to fully support the South Asia's region's goals on financial inclusion and build on the important achievements of AFI's South Asian members over the last decade. Thank you very much and please enjoy the launch. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. Hanig for his uh, introductory remarks for the launch of this very, very historic occasion. Let's give him another big round of applause, please. Thank you so much. And to join him up on stage, I invite the uh, Safi chair. We also see that among the banked, almost a third of women with mobile money accounts said that they would not be able to use it without a family member or an agent, and really points towards the importance of building financial literacy programs, but also allowing women to understand how to use financial products and to save themselves and to be less vulnerable from financial abuse or financial fraud. And I would like to end my presentation with this final slide, and this was actually a question from one of our panelists here as well, is that, what would make women more financially resilient and what would protect them from the income shocks resulting from inflation, from natural disasters, and other financial issues that are facing the women today? And so we asked people, uh, how would you come up with emergency funds and what would be your source? 
And so if you see the bottom left of the slide here, 34% of women said that they would rely on family. So when we were serving in the field, we asked them, who would you go to? And she said, my sister. Uh, and then we asked them, would it be difficult? And she said, yes, but my, her husband would never let her send the money. And often we see that this is the case for family and friends. So it's the most common resource for women, but it's also the hardest. So if you see the red bar here, almost half of them said that even though that's a source, it would be very difficult to use that in case of a real emergency. What's more reliable has been shown through data is savings. And in savings, you see that 18% of women say that that would be their source of emergency money, and almost all of them said that it would be easy to tap into that source. And with this, what this points to, that designing the right kind of savings products, providing easy access to borrowing insurance products, can help women become more financially resilient, more resilient to financial and income shocks in times of an emergency. And with this, uh, I'd like to end my presentation. I think we have an exciting panel next. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Sanya Ansar, ladies and gentlemen, from the World Bank. We have a second presenter before we uh, meet the panel. I'd like to invite Helen Warby, the uh, head gender inclusive uh, finance uh, person for the Alliance for Financial Inclusion. Let's uh, welcome uh, Helen up on stage. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here to share some of the work that the members are doing across the AFI network. Uh, next slide, please, Thomas. So we have a situation quite frequently where members will come to us and say, we want to enact some gender policies in our institution. We have three policies that we want to work on, but which one do we do first, Helen? Which one is going to have the greatest impact in our jurisdiction, where do we best use our resources? And at the moment, we cannot say in the AFI network which are the most impactful policies for helping increase women's financial inclusion. So we have the Guiding Denarau Action Plan, which helps us take forward all of our gender work with the support of the Gender Inclusive Finance Committee. And so we have decided that using the Denarau to guide us, we are going to undertake a large-scale mapping project to map all of the work that you, the members, are doing to support women's financial inclusion. This is the largest piece of research that AFI has ever undertaken on this topic. And we are hoping that at the end of this, we will be able to provide you with key guidance on the most effective way to take gender-inclusive finance policies forward. To be able to do that, we are going to undertake four key aspects in the project. And you can see highlighted here, the first thing we're going to do is we are mapping all of your jurisdictions. So your focal point will have received a request from us to complete a data sheet. If you haven't yet sent it back, um, please send it back. We would very much like your data. Um, we have a very able team waiting to do the analysis and we still have a few missing data points, so please do send your data back. That will help us complete our landscape report. We're also using some global data sets to help us. We will then want to understand the real rich context of what you are doing. Numbers don't tell the whole story. So we are going to do 16 deep dive case studies and we thank and appreciate the members in the room who are supporting us with those. I know that some of you are even doing your interviews here to help us. So this will give us some really, really rich information about what you are doing. We are then looking at the end of this year of providing you with the summary recommendations of the most effective policies that you can look at taking forward in the future. And obviously, we want our policy to be evidence-driven so we are going to be updating the AFI data portal with the latest data so that there's going to be a comprehensive data set available for you as well. If you haven't used the AFI data portal already, it is free to use and to register. And I recommend that in the next coffee break, you look up the AFI data portal 
and create your own login, and then you can start accessing all of our free-to-use data. Uh, next slide, Thomas. It's really important that when we are doing analysis of the work that has been undertaken, that we don't just use one data point. So we have taken data from all of these different global data sets to help us with the analysis because we want to build up the most comprehensive picture of the work that you are doing. And obviously, you can see at the end, we have all of the data that you collect. As Denaro Action Plan 6 says, it's really important to collect this sex disaggregated data because that really does help inform you about the situation of women in your country and the opportunities that you have going forward. Thomas, next slide, please. We also want to show really great appreciation to these 16 member countries. I hope for those of you in the room who see your jurisdiction named up here, you can feel some real pride in the contribution that you are making to this really important piece of work. We thank you enormously for this, and we will be, we will be publishing these soon. So thank you. And we've, we've done some initial analysis. And I'm going to go through this fairly briefly because we also have our team here. Anybody who would like to learn more about this project, come and find me or any of the gender team at any of the breaks, and I'll be happy to talk to you about this in depth and connect you up with some of our consulting team who are supporting us. So we can see a picture that looks a bit like an egg. If you look on the left-hand side of the egg, in the yellow egg yolk, this is where you, as the regulators, you have the most control. You have the mandate, and so this is where we are looking at your foundational policy and regulation will sit. But of course, you can create the best policy in the world, but if you don't have the rails to be able to run that policy, then it's very hard for you to implement it. So the second layer of the egg is around the ICT infrastructure that you have available. It's around the ID that you have available in your country. But we also understand that even if you have those rails, you may have some counterweights that are holding you back or accelerating you. And that is the outer part of the egg. That is the broader economic environment. It's about women's economic participation. It's about women's legal rights. It's about education. It's about MSMEs and their access to finance. But even when we have all of that, the part where you have the most control, and the part where you have less influence, that is still all filtered through our eggshell. Our eggshell is social and cultural norms, and those are porous and pervasive, and they change what you can and can't do. So this is the framework that we are currently working to. We really, really are open to suggestion and guidance and input. So anybody who would like to have an in-depth presentation and be able to engage more with this project, again, please do come and find us. And we just move on to the last slide and I can show you hopefully what you will be able to do with it at the end of it. This is going to be a living, breathing, usable project. It's going to be practical for you to take forward. So we are hoping that you are going to end up with a set of tools that you can use in your regulatory environment. We also are hoping that the framework that we finalize is something that you can take to other ministries, other bodies, the international community who are working in your jurisdiction to help you do the work that you want to do. We're also going to be giving you a globally relevant data set with probably some of the widest data analysis on women's financial inclusion that you have available within your jurisdiction. And also, thanks to all of the members who have partaken in the case studies, you will then be able to read the deep dive case study information and find out some of the really rich context of what other members are doing that is successful. So you can have ideas to take forward. And we're hoping that next year, we will start developing the first ever AFI gender inclusive finance policy model that you will then be able to use across the network to guide your future work. So I'm going to wrap up here, but I thank you very, very much to all the members who have partaken in this. Anybody who has any outstanding data, a big request from me, please, please do send me your data. And also anybody who would like to engage more on the project, I'm here for the remainder of the GPF. Do come and find me and I will be happy to talk to you more about it. But thank you very much.
Thank you so much, uh, Helen, and also uh, uh, Sanya for uh, really setting the tone for this uh, plenary session, Women's Financial Inclusion, Leadership and Diversity. We'll jump right into um, the uh, panel discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I invite the moderator to come up, I'd like to invite the speakers, um, the panel, the panelists, excuse me, for this session. I'd like to invite Elsie uh, Awadzi, the second deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, to please and come come forward and take a seat. Our next panelist is uh, Jamil Ahmad, the Governor, State Bank of Pakistan. Please come forward. Joseph, uh, Mr. Josefa Masitambua, the Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of Fiji. Hazel Gonzalez, a Vice President, Banco Central de Reserva de El Salvador. And the final panelist is Amina Tirana, Head of Policy and Measurement Social Impact Visa. Please come forward. And to moderate this session, we have Pierre Roman, ladies and gentlemen, the Director of the Office of the UNSGSA, to moderate this session. Thank you very much for that introduction. Very excited to moderate this power panel. I think with the name itself, you can already... Okay, could we um, request some fresh water for the panelists, please? We will have very intense discussions and we might need the water. <laughs> There is no gender balance in this panel. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think we I think we have been set up excellently with the, by the two presentations today, the Findex summary as well as the overview of the AFI mapping. My biggest takeaway there are three things. One is that we have accomplished so much as a network, the gender gap decreased for the first time since we started Findex in 2011. And that, I am sure, in no small measure, was because of all the actions that you have taken in this network, the Denarau Action Plan, and all the things that, as a network, you have done in your own countries. I think you all deserve a round of applause. Also to wake up the crowd post-lunch. And I think we will see it in the mapping, too just the substantial um, initiatives that the AFI members have done. But the other takeaway is definitely there is still so much to be done. The headline figures represent a decrease in the gender gap, but if we look, you know, maybe in country, in the regions, if we look deeper at the data, we know that there is still so much more to be done. We have to go beyond gender parity in account ownership and really see whether access to financial services really provides effective access to products that build women's resilience, financial health, and tools to really seize economic opportunity. And that is our big challenge as a community, but I know that you know, we will hear from the panel that we will get there. And the last one, I think, is really seeing that access is not the end, right? It is really a means towards positive outcomes. And I was actually very pleased to see the lobby of the GPF where we have the AFI cubes, but we also have the SDGs underpinning them. And in this panel, we of course focus on SDG number five. So just premising on the fact that yes, we have done so much, but no, there is still much more that needs to be done. I am very pleased to moderate this panel today. And um, you know, the work has to really be beyond policy, and, and Helen, I'm not challenging the egg, but I will recast it in three Ps. Policy, but we also need public goods, digital public goods, the infrastructure, as Helen pointed out, the second layer of the egg. And we need to enable the private sector through the products that really make sense for women. 
So let us hear from our panel today, and maybe I could start with, you know, we have the esteemed deputy governors here, but so that it could be more conversational, I hope you don't mind if I call you by your first names. <laughs> we have Elsie, and let me start um, a question with for you. I think yesterday, and we all saw this in social media of the AFI, all the announcements, you hosted a leader's breakfast. I would call that a power breakfast. In women's leadership, institutional diversity, and importance in making male allies. So we have, of course, <laughs> our DG here from <laughs> PG. What were some key points and takeaways from your discussion yesterday? If you could give the crowd here who are not at the breakfast a sneak peek at some of the key points from the breakfast yesterday. Let's start off with that, Elsie. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to try and attempt to um, synthesize what we talked about. First and foremost, I agree it was a power breakfast uh, in every sense of the word. Number one, the fact that we had 32 leaders in the room, um, 14 of which were men. And uh, for me, that was very powerful. It was powerful because we had, I could see many women leaders. Um, these were central bank governors or deputy governors or, or heads of other um, regulatory institutions. Um, but we had 14 strong men uh, who were key allies uh, of, of women. And for me, that was, that was a really good picture to see. Uh, the discussions were very animated. Um, one, there was agreement on the fact that there, there wasn't gender balance, gender equity in top leadership um, of central banks and regulatory institutions um, that are making policy and laws that affect access to finance. And, and the fact that uh, that is something that needed to be worked on. So I'll give you some statistics. For example, the OMFIF uh, Gender Balance Index of 2020-21 said that only 15 central banks around the world are headed by a woman. And out of 31 central bank governors appointed in 2020, only one was a woman. There are only 10, only 10 percent of heads of institutions are women. And within the AFI network, 10 member institutions are led by a woman, and 40 member institutions have at least one female deputy head of institution. Now, this is a lot of progress, so let's, uh, let's celebrate that. But it is also not at all even the beginning of what is possible. And I think yesterday the conversations were very clear about there are capable women in every one of our countries. The problem is that they are not visible to the appointing authority, uh, and the fact that a lot more has to be done to find them. Uh, because there are benefits in finding women, in having women in leadership, and more gender equity. One, it is only fair, because in many of our countries, women represent at least 50% of the population. In some cases that were mentioned yesterday, um, there were more women than men in those countries. Uh, and so it's only fair to see a fair representation of women in leadership, in top leadership. But what is more is the fact that with w more women in top leadership, we begin to see um, things, you know, different perspectives in the way policies and regulations are made. Um, these then begin to help us support more inclusion, financial inclusion. Um, what is more, this model for the private sector, the actual providers of financial services, how important it is to have women in their top leadership. Uh, and therefore, then they are able to provide craft and design products and services that help um, women um, as well as the, 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 the general population. So um, there was agreement on all of this. Now what we find, just in, in wrapping up on this, what we found was that in a number of countries that re were represented at breakfast, um, legal mandate had been important in promoting more women in leadership. For some, it was a constitutional provision, um, some act of parliament or the other. For some, it was policy within the institution. Um, but what we found was more profound was champions, was the role of champions, individual champions, and sometimes these champions were men, um, who made it a point to seek out capable women in 
draw them in, uh, to make them more visible, and to actually encourage them to be more confident to step up to, to leadership roles. Um, so, so basically, we ended the breakfast with um, a call for action. Um, every one of us being committed to doing what we can to be the champions in our various institutions. Um, and hopefully also have more such frank discussions um, to galvanize more. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I think um, that insight itself is very promising. We definitely look forward to what the champions and the ripples of all the things that you will do together as champions of this. And really just going beyond balance for balance sake, which is already good, but benefiting from the institutional diversity that comes with it, which I think will trickle to, to, to the institutions and to the, the entities that you also supervise and regulate. So thank you for sharing that. It's interesting how Elsie started with data and facts, right? She gave us how many were in the, at the breakfast, you know, how many of the central bank governors were women. And data is really what compels us to act because then we see where the gaps are and where we should go. And so on that point, if I may turn over, um, to Joseph, uh, and you've done a lot on this, on collecting gender disaggregated data in Fiji. If you could share with us, you know, what is the role of sex disaggregated data in evidence-based policy making in Fiji? But we want to understand the journey that you took to get there. What, you know, what data did you decide to collect? How did you analyze that? And then translate that into policy. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me uh, just say that uh, uh, I was wondering what my qualification to be on this panel is, but uh, and uh, I'm flattered. But uh, I've been in central banking for 25 years, and a large part of that I've been involved in financial inclusion. So I'm not a new face around the GPF. And I've been fortunate enough that my journey in uh, central banking has taken me around financial inclusion and financial regulation. So I think I, you know, I, I do uh, I meet some minimum standards to be uh, to pass or to contribute to this panel. And also, uh, as a, as a father and a grandfather of five beautiful granddaughters, I have a huge skin in this game. So. You know, <laughs> So financial inclusion and, and uh, you know, Fiji's journey, our, we started our first uh, national financial uh, inclusion strategy in 2010. And, and like many others, we started off with uh, access, promoting access, driving the access points out. And then we've transitioned and we've uh, just launched our third strategy. And now we are starting to say, okay, that's fine. We check the box, as the deputy governor in Kenya said. And now we have to start uh, drilling down into uh, whether we are providing the financial services that uh, you know that the vulnerable need, and especially uh, women. So our challenge around addressing this uh, and. After our second uh, financial inclusion strategy, we uh, launched uh, or we had a policy on desegregated data. And one of the challenges we had, uh, and I think a lot of supervisors and uh, development uh, uh, staff out there will appreciate the inertia that we had to push the financial service providers to provide data that they feel that doesn't necessarily uh, contribute to their bottom line. So we had to push that a bit. So that was one of the challenges. These legacy systems that they have, which appalled us a bit, that they wouldn't find it uh, necessarily uh, something that they would want to know at any point in time, how many women accounts or how many are the breakdown by gender. We understand that there's challenges around companies and SMEs around classifying, but that's another challenge we faced. The SME classification and um, one other thing is the uh, unique data set so that we are able to prevent double counting so that we can really get to the precise numbers that we are talking about. As the moderator had mentioned, uh, good data guides good policy. I'm not really a numbers man. I am more of a field type of person, uh, but I've come to appreciate that 
you can't improve what you can't measure. So those are some of the challenges. It's been a long journey, but uh, we've finally been able to have at least uh, three uh, sets of uh, disaggregated data, and this is, this is enabling us to, uh, to have a grounds to lean on the financial service providers and say like, okay, you're doing enough, because one challenge we have is they, they like to do a lot. We must commend them for helping us in this journey of reducing our, our gender gap. We have reduced our gender gap, even though we are slightly above our peer or developing partners, and we attribute this a lot to our development partners, but we need to push them more. We need to target their effort more into what we want or what we see rather than what they feel uh, gains them the most mileage. So those are some of the challenges and the journey that we've, uh, we've had so far. Thank you for sharing that. And despite the challenges, because of the clear vision, you're able to, to get the, those sets of um, sex disaggregated data that has helped in policy. Um, if I may turn over um, to DG Sima, another example of someone with a clear vision, a policy from the State Bank of Pakistan on banking on equity. Um, I think as UNSGSA, Her Majesty also um, championed and supported um, this very important um, policy of Pakistan. And, you know, if you could tell us more about the ambition, why did you think of putting this in place? Um, what are your, you know, how will you measure success and what will success look like for you for this um, policy? Thank you, and um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, way back, I think in 2017, we had a national financial inclusion vision at the Central Bank. And we worked very hard. And as uh, Sanya was saying, the top line numbers were good because financial inclusion, uh, which we can on a baseline measure as financial accounts, was growing and we were doing well. But as a country of 220 million people, say about 110 million adults, and in that, we only had 20 million women with accounts. Those were just accounts. Of that, only 11 million women had active accounts. So we have a ser serious issue. So that's one reason why we had to do this. And the second, perhaps more concerning reason was that the gender gap was actually growing. And women were just not getting included at the same pace as men. So we concluded, and this was a, like a few years ago, that something had to be done. And we had to move from, it's okay, here is this product, and it's for men and women, which is gender neutral, to gender intentional. So, that, that, so those were the two reasons. And so we decided that it was no longer possible just to talk. And I'm afraid that tends to happen a lot. We talk, and, and with all respect, we come to conferences, we talk a lot about women, we say all the right things. Some of the men especially understand it, perhaps they don't believe it. I'm sorry to have to say that, but I think all the women in this room will agree with that. So we decided, and frankly it wasn't me, it was a lot of the men, and it began before um, I even joined the central bank. We decided that we would have, we would use our regulatory remit to actually come up with a policy. But we didn't force it down anyone's throat. We went through one of the longest um, consultative process with the financial institutions, with civil civic society, as, you, as it's called, with partners internationally and locally with a number of sessions, number of sessions, and those were all during COVID, so they were all on Zoom and so on. And then we came up with the policy, which was finalized and rolled out in September of last year. And it has five key pillars. The first is that the institutions we regulate must be diverse in their workforce. Because if you have men working for men 
They will design products for men. They may not do it intentionally. It's just the way they, they are or they've been brought up. So, so we had, and that if you looked at the banking sector, only 13% of the workforce is women. And there are banks which I'll remain nameless, who I know from my background, who said we will not hire women. So we have set a target for 2024 for them to have 20% women. And there is no deviation. And each one has been a you know, target. So that's the first pillar. The second pillar we asked, and there's subsets, and I won't go into all those details, but we then asked that each bank sets up a women's department, agreed to by their boards, and has a, applies a gender lens to every product and service that they have. For example, when they're saving products, Women will want to save, as we've talked about these saving clubs, we call them committees or kitties, and so on. They must look at that need. The women's need is often for the home. It's often uh, for their children. And so we asked, so those committees have all been set up. The gender, gender lens is to be applied to all existing. We've given timelines, which we will monitor. So that's that. The third pillar is women's champions at each access point. We're still very much a bricks and mortar country, although digital is moving very fast. So each of the major branches of, of each of the financial institution is to have by 2024, 75% will have a women's champion. It can be a man, that's okay, but they will have somebody who will make sure that any woman who comes to the call center or to the app or to the branch uh, is treated with value, is welcomed and respected. So that's the third, third one, women's champion. The fourth, very importantly, the collection of uh, gender disaggregated data. Because that, without that, there is no impact, we don't know what we're doing and we don't inform policy. And the last pillar is a gender forum chaired by the governor, which has a cross-section, a formal forum which will have a cross-section of not just banks, but the banks associations, microfinance, but also industry leaders, women's voices, the more conservative part, everyone is there so that they can talk about how we can improve policy as we go forward. So that's the bank, so it's very, very um, targeted. And then we set targets for everything. And uh, not just women's accounts, but agricultural finance, SME finance, microfinance, all those targets regularly monitored in consultation. And we can talk about it a little bit later uh, with good results so far. So they're not impossible targets. So, so that's what we're trying to do. It's a bit forced. I mean, I think people can argue that we are over forcing the issue, but mm. I think there was no other choice. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've done. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing that. And so encouraging to see what very clear policies you can arrive at when you, know, you don't accept just the status quo, you don't just look at top line figures, but you really ask the hard questions. And what I really like, despite those very, you know, clear five pillars. You said this was done, you know, consulting the, the, the stakeholders. And so it can be done. Quite encouraging for all of us here. And there's a lot of models that we have already learned from the panel, but I will now turn over from Asia and move to hear other good examples and maybe turn over to you, Hazel, if you could share with us, you know, what are the other emerging good practices um, for women's financial inclusion? If you could tell us a little bit about your um, experience in El Salvador. Hey, thank you so much. I'm gonna answer in Spanish so I can make it quickly and you don't suffer with my English, okay? <laughs> so you have time to speak. Um, antes que nada, agradecer a la AFI por este espacio eh, que está dando El Salvador, a ese pequeño país de Centroamérica que está dando mucho, que está dando mucho de qué hablar. Eh, en El Salvador, el Banco Central de Reserva es el regulador del sistema financiero, por tanto, nos compete 
eh, implementar todas esas eh, políticas públicas eh, que le apliquen al sector financiero. Creo que uno de los grandes beneficios que hemos tenido como país es contar con un líder, eh, con el presidente Nayib Bukele, que le apuesta eh, al tema de inclusión y educación financiera. Y eso ha sido uno de los primeros aceleradores que nosotros hemos tenido, que el apoyo viene del más alto nivel y creo que, que eso ocurre en muy pocos países, hay que hacer mucho lobby para que este, este tema avance. Eh, uno de los grandes pasos que hizo el presidente fue aprobar y la creación del Consejo Nacional de Inclusión Financiera, que aglutina a 10 entidades que se coordinan eh, interinstitucionalmente y que trabajan por la inclusión y la educación financiera del país. Tenemos al Ministerio de Economía, el Instituto de Garantía y Depósito, yo sé que muchos acá ya tienen esos consejos nacionales de educación financiera, en nuestro caso ha resultado bastante bien. Eso ha permitido coordinar todas las estrategias y los objetivos y los planes de acción que se aprobaron también gracias al Presidente de la República en la Política Nacional de Inclusión Financiera el año pasado y recientemente, hace una, do, eh, dos semanas, eh, tenemos la aprobación también de la Estrategia Nacional de Educación Financiera. Entonces, bajo esos tres instrumentos, eh, el país está avanzando, está dando grandes pasos. Uno de los pilares importantes de la Política Nacional de Inclusión Financiera ha sido la innovación y la digitalización de servicios financieros. En esta línea, el Banco Central impulsó también el año pasado eh, el lanzamiento de un sistema de pagos gratuito para toda la población, se llama Transfer 365. Es un sistema de pagos inclusivo que le ha ahorrado a la población alrededor de 12 millones de dólares en el primer, en el primer año en el que ha estado a disposición. Y esto ha permitido no solo tener ese sector privado que maneja las transferencias interbancarias y que cobra comisiones, ¿verdad? sino que le ha permitido también eh, que las sociedades de ahorro y crédito participen en este sistema de pagos, que participen también las cajas de crédito, los bancos cooperativos. Entonces, eso ha sido un acelerador importante dentro de nuestras políticas y también sabemos que las mujeres eh, son las que tienen mayor miedo a realizar transferencias o utilizar los servicios digitales, ¿verdad? Entonces, estamos dando un acompañamiento a través del transfer. También lanzamos Transfer 365 Móvil, que únicamente asociando el número de teléfono a una cuenta bancaria se pueden hacer transferencias y pagos eh, interbancarios de manera gratuita los 365 días del año. Y lanzamos también el Transfer 365 Business para todos esos emprendedores eh, que quieran realizar transferencias igual de manera gratuita. Otra de las buenas prácticas que, que tenemos es que estamos en constante diálogo con el sector privado, eh, tenemos mesas con la industria y esto ha sido muy bueno porque eh, les preguntamos si necesitaban alguna política especial o alguna regulación especial para darle acceso y uso eh, a los servicios financieros, para promover el servicio financiero en mujeres y ellos eh, dijeron que no, ¿verdad? que no era necesario, que ya habían mecanismos entonces, creo que hay un tema en el sector privado todavía de voluntad eh, para promover cuentas, por ejemplo, de ahorros eh, con requisitos simplificados que le lleguen a las mujeres y hace falta también impulsar desde la parte de educación financiera cuáles son los beneficios. Eh, por otro lado, también tenemos una estrecha relación con la Comisión Financiera de la Asamblea Legislativa, en algunos países lo conocen como Parlamento o el Congreso, eso nos ha permitido como país hacer cambios estructurales importantes en leyes que tenían décadas sin modificarse, donde identificamos barreras importantes, por ejemplo, eh, eliminamos la cantidad de dinero mínimo para, para poder abrir una cuenta con requisitos simplificados, eso hicimos una reforma a la ley para facilitar la inclusión financiera, eh, también hemos hecho reformas al historial crediticio, a la protección al consumidor y estamos trabajando también en eliminar, por ejemplo, comisiones eh, por los servicios de adquiriencia en las terminales de cobro, estamos promoviendo también servicios de tecnología sin contacto, todo esto de la mano con la comisión financiera. Eh, las alianzas estratégicas que tenemos también con AFI,
con, o, con otras organizaciones, con, como la Fundación Esparcacen, con ONU Mujeres. Eso nos ha permitido también transversalizar el tema de género y no solo dejarlo en las instituciones eh, financieras, ¿verdad? Sino que estamos colaborando eh, con otras instituciones. Además, eh, creo que es importante destacar que estamos hablando de mujeres que no conocen qué es eh, una tarjeta de crédito, que no conocen qué es una cuenta de ahorro y queremos acercar eso a la población. Entonces, estamos realizando también muchas ferias donde hacemos convenios con instituciones financieras, llevamos los productos financieros, llevamos las instituciones financieras a la, a la población, a las mujeres en específico, para que la conozcan. Eh, yo creo que una política de inclusión financiera por sí misma no va a lograr una igualdad de género, ¿verdad? Es, es muy difícil que eso lo haga, pero podemos promover una equidad eh, y acceso de, de servicios financieros a las mujeres y obviamente sabemos el potencial que, económico y social que esto le puede dar a las mujeres. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I think from your remarks, it's also very clear how important really collaboration with all stakeholders is involved, starting from the having a champion as you started off, but really, you know, the legislative bodies, um, and you also highlighted the private sector, which is a perfect segue to our sole private sector representative on the <laughs> panel. I will turn over now to Amina. I think we heard a lot of um, signaling from the policymakers and the regulators how important this is and what that communicates to the private sector. What do you see as really the importance of this collaboration and dialogue um, in terms of really rolling out products that are gender intentional, as Yima said, it, if we say neutral, it's really not neutral. I think we know that already. So what do you want this public-private um, partnership or collaboration to, to result in from a private sector perspective? Super, thank you so much. Um, I, like many, I think everyone here, I'm thrilled to be back in person and seeing so many friends I'd also like to add that I'm here with several visa colleagues, all male, and we had an animated conversation about who was going to represent us because my colleague Mario really wanted to be on this panel, but is actually going to present on uh, cryptocurrency tomorrow instead. He's better versed in that. So um, we recognize that men are super important in the champions as well, and we're thrilled that we have so many men across our network who really believe in this. And what I'd like to share is really Visa's perspective about how together we can drive the outcomes that we want um, and the different roles that we all play, because no one can do it independently. And our vision comes really from being a network of networks across so many, so many countries across the world, more than 200 billion transactions in the last year, 70 million places of usage. It's a lot of local insight. But our real goal is how do we enable inclusive and equitable participation in the digital economy, right? Really, that's the end outcome. And why do I say participation in the digital economy? It's because what we're seeing today is that those people and businesses and communities that are able to participate in the digital economy are tending to do better than those who do not. So it, it's a factor in growing wealth and prosperity, but also in lives, right? What does it mean for you? And we're, we really, want to make sure that that reaches everyone, but we're also concerned about the risk of people and communities who will be left behind. And that can include people who today have been doing just fine, but might not be participating in the digital transformation. So with that in mind, what Visa's vision is that there are three things we should all focus on to drive uh, greater equity and inclusion. The first is access. The second is trusted convenience. And the third is the knowledge and skills to be able to use that and participate. And I'll start with the first, which is access. Um, and this is really table stakes. It's access to financial services. Um, and I, time permitting, I'll come back to the kinds of products and services and innovations that Visa provides. But it's really how those are used. Access, and it's come up quite a bit already in the AFI discussions the last couple of days, it's also gateway services, energy, infrastructure, telecommunications, um, data, 
policymakers have a huge influence on that and in encouraging investment and innovation that reaches the last mile. The second point after access is trusted convenience. And let me break those apart into, into both components. First is trust. So Visa, we are a trust brand. Nothing is more important to us than the trust in the service. And in the first instance, that's the billions of dollars that we pour into security, technical security, making sure that uh, that security is there, not just for a basic transaction or payments, but all kinds of innovations and all the connectivity across different kinds of providers. But trust we know goes beyond just security of a, a data point or transaction. It's the reliability to know that that service is there for you 24 seven, day in and day out. And sometimes that day in and day out can be harder than a pilot project or an innovation. Um, it takes a lot of col collaboration. Um, and the third part of trust is for the user. It's, it's that the service is actually achieving what you want with that service or product. That's a form of trust as well. The trusted convenience, here we're seeing technologies making just a world of difference on convenience. It's putting things in the palm of someone's hand. Um, and when you put those two things together, it can be quite powerful. And I'd like to give a couple of examples. Um, in Egypt, for example, we work with the post office and a fintech called Paysky on a app, mobile app. Everything is mobile if you're youth, and it just puts it in the palm of their hands. We have similar products in Italy as well, um, with the Ministry of Education on study programs, and also with the Italian post office on a uh, post-to-pay green product, which is specifically for teenagers between 11 and 17, allowing them to pay for transportation or their lunch. And more importantly, it allows parents to set controls over what's spent. And I, you know, anything that can square what a teenager wants and what a parent wants, yeah, <laughs> Let, let's go for that. Um, so those are just a couple of the models of trusted convenience, and there's so many more. But it also goes to that point that it has to be localized. And local doesn't mean just for a geography. It means for the demographic, for the age, for the sector, for the interest, for what you're using it for. And the last thing then I'd, that I'd like to go to is the knowledge and skills. So we have access, trusted convenience, and knowledge and skills. Without the understanding or the ability to use something, it's really of no use to you, even if it's there and even if it's affordable. And what's super interesting is we're finding this very, very deep relationship between the, these three components of trust and skills. So for example, if you understand something, you tend to have more trust in it. If you're familiar with it, you'll have more trust in it. But we're also finding that the most effective ways to build both trust and also skills and education is through the local peer community, right? It, very often, and someone just, just on the way over here, one of my, our colleagues was talking about in her home country in Indonesia, the restaurant owners were writing out on the QR codes on their tables instructions for what people should do on to how to use a QR code to access the menu or how to pay. That's instruction, but it was also this trusted peer community. So that leaves us as, as a provider with an interesting question of how do we scale that? So from Visa's perspective, we do a lot about making our products really easy to use, simple, just-in-time information related to that. that. That's our responsibility. We're also providing a lot of financial education, public platforms, practical business skills, practical money skills, that we then collaborate with governments, with nonprofits, um, other institutions at a community level to make those available to um, all kinds of individuals to use them and to learn in ways that work for them. Um, for example, across Latin America, we, we work with Fundes, a nonprofit, on the platform ENCO for small business owners, reaching, I think, 100,000 to date, you know, including, I think, in El Salvador. Pretty sure of that as well. Um, so it's just a few examples, right? It's incumbent upon us to make sure that information is available to complement it, but also to partner with all of the, the community level networks, be they financial institutions, fintechs, cooperatives, to make sure there's the right product, but also the right kind of information. And of course, the role of government across all three of these is enormous, both in terms of setting the policies, but also the partnership to deliver. And I can elaborate on any of those, but I'll stop there.
Yeah, no, great. Just on your ending, I mean, you think talk about access and trust and convenience and knowledge and skills. They could, you know, as an imperative for visa, but they could also very well be public policy objectives that we're trying exactly. to pursue. So definitely alignment there, and why not coordinate and collaborate towards, you know, these outcomes that we want to see. But I'd like to turn over to DG Sima because, and, and want to see how, Amina, you will react to this because, um, so it's great, there's alignment, we can collaborate. But I think one of the pillars you mentioned, um, uh, DG Sima, is that, you have targets for the private sector to have the institutional diversity, as you said, and to serve women better, so very distinct targets. And having my old regulator hat on, I know that could be very, uh, that could be an issue for supervised institutions if, if you know, you're setting these targets. Um, but explain to us, if you could share with us, how you came up with this, how the institutions, um, also embraced and understood and appreciated it. And then after that, I'd like to turn over to Amina and see your reactions to that. But I'll follow up with a question later. But DG Sima. Thank you. So uh, just, to, just to clarify, the targets, while we have the, the legal ability to make targets mandatory, we did not make them mandatory. Um, we do that very, very rarely, and perhaps only in another area we've done. Wherever there is severe market failure, where uh, in our country we see a lot of market failure uh, because of the pri providers of finance have other very profitable and risk-free avenues. But in this case, these were consultative. We used data. We used, and we had conversations with almost every bank uh, as to what the baseline would be. And I think um, over time, and it's only been, well, it, it hasn't even been a year, but we are already seeing that those targets are coming on, some patchy with some banks. But I'll give you a few examples. Um, a little while ago, I mentioned that we only had 11 million active women's accounts, which is um, embarrassing. Uh, for us, so we've made this targets over up to 2024. And uh, for the calendar year, this calendar year, the target we've set is 25.7 million women's accounts. The data we have is for March, and we've already crossed 21 million. So, you know, it's getting there. Another piece of data, um, agricultural finance. So we're in a largely agrarian economy. Uh, and so we set a target for 525,000 women borrowers for the end of this calendar year. We already have 421,000. So the targets were set in a way that are achievable and are being met. And then, of course, we will have conversations with those banks uh, or M microfinance or development finance organizations which have not met the targets, and there may be valid reasons. So it's, it's interactive, uh, but we will use our moral suasion wherever, wherever we can. And it's the same with SME. We've been very successful. We wanted about 13,000 borrowers uh, for this year, for the end of this calendar year, and we got 12,000 already. So it's the focus that we have put on it. Many banks have now, the major ones, the larger ones, already come up with women's specific labeled products, which makes a huge difference. So I think all of those aspects have certainly helped. Now that's a great clarification. I think clarity in communicating this to the banks too and let, letting them appreciate why this is important. I mean, the diversity of their institutions and their portfolios will benefit them eventually. So if they also appreciate it, you know, they also take it upon themselves to, to reach so sorry, I'm just adding one more thing. It, they have also discovered that it contributes to the bottom line. Exactly. And once the they realize rate. that, then I think it happens on its own. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And you don't even need to set the targets anymore. Yes. They will, they will meet them and exceed them. Hopefully we will not need to. For sure. For sure. No, thank you for that point. I just want to head, uh, pass back to, to Amina on this because, you know, how does this 
also incentivize the thinking within the private sector, and in your case, within Visa, to really think about developing products and services um, that are targeted to, to women for a, specific, uh, for, for, for a specific market. I think we heard it, it has to be intentional. We have to know the needs, the life cycle, and to be really responsive to those needs. So how does this help? How are you thinking about this? So we unequivocally, unequivocally welcome the leadership and the prioritization from policymakers around uh, women and, and reaching women and making that very clear. We're super committed to that and we can follow, follow your lead. As a company, uh, there is perhaps very little uh, that does not have specific data and key, uh, key performance indicators attached to it across everything we do. I mean, that's how a business functions, um, and we have strong alignment. Um, one of the challenges, and it's a practical challenge for Visa, is that we see the transaction, but there's nothing in a transaction that tells us who made that transaction. Was it a man or a woman? So we take data privacy incredibly seriously. Right, this is one of these things, right? I mean, even when I'm doing studies, I lead research, and I'm doing studies, I'm like, I can't see any of the informa personal information that identifies an individual, because that's how seriously we take protecting your identity. But that's also a challenge for us, so we, we welcome that. How do we get to that? Some of you may remember that Visa set a commitment in support of the World Bank's goal of universal financial access to bring in 500 million people, which we did between unbanked and underserved from 2015, and we achieved that before the end of 2019. Of that, we estimated that 54% were women. Now, how do we say that in full transparency? We had to do some data science using a combination of our transaction data and global public data. Um, it was our best estimate. We worked really closely with the World Bank to make that as rigorous as possible, um, but we couldn't say down to the individual. But what I want, do want to say to going to gender intentionality it really is about a diversity of products so that women, as well as men, can choose and have what's appropriate for them um, and, and what's useful for their needs. And to that end, I would like to, just a short anecdote of a woman we came to meet through a survey that we did in Mexico in uh, October of 2020, partway into the pandemic. And we did a survey of the micro and very, very small businesses in Mexico that had recently started to accept or use more digital payments. And we asked, what difference does this make? And one of the women who responded um, was the owner of a store. It was her parents' store in the rural mountains in the north of Mexico, right next to a big mine. And her parents were getting older and called on her to come help run the store. And when she took it over, it was 100% cash. But all of the men who, and it was all men who worked in the mine, had payment accounts thanks to the government's policies and, and, and t particularly tiered KYC. And so she started to accept digital payments. And by the time we met her, or I should say the social research firm met her, um, she had uh, about 70% of transactions were digital. More importantly, and over the course of five years, she said her sales grew three times and what really struck me and what I want to leave you all with is what she said, well, the big difference it really made for her in her life, in, apart from the income, was that she was able to live with her wife in the state capital and with her kids and her family time was great and quality was greatly improved because she could access her business and financial accounts through her phone and the computer. And so when we think about lives and livelihoods, I remember Anna Rosa's story really, really well because ultimately it is about life and it is about your family and your well-being. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. And yeah, maybe I should um, now also turn over to El Salvador again, Hazel. Maybe you could um, share with us some of the, also your efforts in collecting this kind of data, going beyond the numbers and understanding the stories and what are the success factors that you could share with us and um, with everyone today. Sí, bueno, como muchos bancos centrales de los que estamos acá eh, reunidos sabemos la importancia y manejamos y estamos acostumbrados a elaborar estadísticas macroeconómicas, por ende sabemos lo importante que es tener información de calidad, oportuna, eh, desagregación por sexo, eh, geográficamente también, 
Entonces, en este sentido, y me gustaría compartirles algunos datos eh, sobre la encuesta, específicamente para El Salvador del Global Findec. En El Salvador, el 23.2% de mujeres poseen una cuenta financiera, una cuenta en una institución financiera. El 10.8% ha solicitado algún tipo de crédito. Mujeres que poseen cuenta dinero móvil, 10.1%. Eh, mujeres con al menos una tarjeta de crédito, 10.6%. 22.5% de mujeres ha, ha realizado o recibido un pago digital. Entonces, ¿qué estamos observando acá? Existen, obviamente, brechas eh, y barreras naturales que estamos observando en el acceso de mujeres a este tipo de productos, ¿verdad? Entonces, ¿qué tenemos que hacer como reguladores? Eh, Crear regulación, ¿verdad? Obviamente para disminuir estas, estas barreras, las garantías que, que les exigen a las mujeres, simplificar requisitos. De igual manera, en El Salvador, alrededor del 65% de la población tiene internet, el 85% tiene eh, un teléfono móvil. Sin embargo, al ver las estadísticas y los datos, por ejemplo, el 5.8% utiliza el teléfono eh, para hacer pagos o facturas de mujeres. El 6.3% de mujeres usa el teléfono móvil o internet para enviar dinero. El 5.4% de mujeres usa el teléfono móvil para comprar en línea. Entonces, obviamente aquí estamos observando otro tipo de brechas, eh, otro tipo de barreras, probablemente de autonomía económica y de poder de decisión sobre, las, sobre el dinero por sí de, en el hogar, ¿verdad? Entonces, Estamos trabajando mucho para dar la información a Helen. Y en este sentido, hemos hecho varias encuestas. Comenzamos con la primera este año para conocer un poco cuáles eran las posiciones de liderazgo de las mujeres en las instituciones financieras y cómo estaban ofreciendo también las instituciones financieras productos y servicios financieros. El, como, como lo ha dicho la mayoría acá, únicamente el 14% de las mujeres está en posiciones de dirección en las, en las instituciones financieras. Eh, las juntas directivas están representadas por alrededor un 18%. Los puestos de dirección eh, representan un 40% de mujeres. Pero cuando vamos hacia abajo y vemos el equipo staff, la gente que mueve eh, las instituciones, el 55% son mujeres. Y cuando les preguntamos a las instituciones si están ofreciendo algún tipo de producto financiero, mencionaron que sí, que tienen productos dirigidos a las mujeres. Eso ha sido muy gratificante verlo y hemos observado también cómo a través del Consejo Nacional de Inclusión Financiera, nuestros bancos estatales y nuestros bancos de desarrollo están ofreciendo productos específicos, líneas de crédito, microcréditos, líneas eh, para adquirir vivienda. Eh, también estamos recolectando información sobre finanzas verdes, ten minutes, okay. <ríe> eh, y hemos visto que las mujeres, eh, que las instituciones financieras están dando eh, productos financieros verdes al menos al 17% de mujeres. Entonces, en este sentido, para nosotros es muy importante tener información desagregada, información que nos sirva para hacer las mejores políticas, sino a quién nos estamos dirigiendo si no tenemos esa información eh, la más actualizada posible. Estamos actualizando la encuesta de acceso y uso de servicios financieros con AFI. Ya tenemos eh, resultados, no la actualizábamos desde el 2016. Vamos a tener una nueva fotografía eh, del Salvador. Sabemos que estamos haciendo muchos cambios, probablemente no se recojan todos los frutos en esta medición que estamos haciendo en, en esos momentos pero eh, sí creemos que estamos avanzando a grandes pasos, también estamos actualizando la encuesta de capacidades, vamos a ver cómo está, qué, qué tan buenos hemos sido como Banco Central y como Consejo Nacional de Educación Financiera en fortalecer la parte de educación. Y también estamos actualizando eh, la encuesta de sistemas de pagos con AFI. Entonces, sí creo que, que es muy importante el uso de, de data muy actualizada, creemos que esa es la única vía para formular políticas públicas que le funcionen a las mujeres y en general a todos los grupos vulnerables. Muchas gracias. Thank you for that. My my device did not work towards the end, so I had to rely on my 
<laughs> very poor um, <laughs> Spanish, <laughs> but um, thank you for, for, for that intervention, the real importance of data, understanding the gaps. And I think you, you shared some insights on gaps that go at different levels, right? Yes. From just the products and services, but also access to a mobile phone. So we have to think about whether you know, these building blocks have some exclusionary um, components to them. Is it harder for a woman to get access to a mobile phone? For, for an ID, for, you know, for the rail, so to speak, that, that Helen was, was talking about. So being very intentional at all these levels, at infrastructure, at policy, at product level, um, I think is key. So thank you for those insights. And I think I will turn over to our now sole um, <laughs> um, male representative on the panel, um, I go back to you. My question here is, is really about your biggest challenges in collecting the data, but I think you already discussed that earlier um, in terms of um, the challenges that you faced. So maybe you could um, share a little bit of forward looking in terms of where you think um, work still needs to be done, what you would prioritize, uh, you know, knowing what you already know um, moving forward. Thank you. I think uh, at, in Fiji we see uh, this gender issue and uh, we see the numbers and the reduction in the, uh, in the gender gap. And this, uh, we had two demand side surveys and this has been reaffirmed by the numbers that we had on the supply side. So we see our gap has been uh, the latest one around 2020, 2021 is 11%. So we see a a large, uh, commendable progress. But as we have been reiterating, it's not good enough. We are seeing the glass is half empty. There's still a lot of work to be done. So thinking about the issue, uh, delving a bit deeper, we see that there is um, like a two-speed type of thing, where there is um, a greater economic prosperity in the urban areas where there is uh, more educated uh, communities, uh, more affluence, there seems to be a greater acceptance. Of, you know, so it's telling us that education is, is the key. The, the norms, the social norms and all seem to be uh, following a lot and this is out in the rural areas and the vulnerable sectors of the community, in the housing, in the projects where things are a bit more tougher. So it's harder for women in those settings to have the freedom to just go and open an account without the husband agitating a bit. And this is confirmed anecdotally with a lot of, uh, you know, we go out into the community, I have my team sitting there, and we go out with partners funded by UNCDF, and this is a common uh, story that's coming back to us. Uh, we, so, it's a great sowing of these social norms, uh, but it's never good enough. It's just like us as central bankers, we have 2% growth, 3% growth, but it's never good enough. We want more, and more because we still see that right at the heart of it, there's still uh, you know, a large freezing. At the, um, at the uh, breakfast, uh, you know, we had the sharing uh, that uh, my colleague, uh, Deputy Governor Elsie, has mentioned. And, you know, I listened to the other countries uh, sharing. And these are Deputy Governors, female Deputy Governors. And my country hasn't got a female Deputy Governor yet. But in saying that, uh, our executive management, there's only three, three males. Two is me and a governor that are male, and one more, the head of economics, and the rest are female. So it's only a matter of time. So like as I said, there's a great thawing. I think the, the social uh, and the cultural norm is our greatest challenge, to enable the woman to be able to feel the freedom to go and open an account. I think if we reach that step, there may be other issues that we'll grapple with uh, as you know, I know my colleagues uh, in the more affluent, uh, like in the urban areas, I just asked a few of them, male colleagues, do you have a joint account or do you have uh, separate accounts? No, we have separate accounts. Okay. So I'm uh, a bit old and mature. I only have, uh, I have a joint account and uh, it's all in my wife's control. 
So I find that that's how we keep peace at home. Eh? So, you know, it, it, there's a thawing, it will grow. Eh? So, and I said this two speed, we need to work. So, this, this, this uh, data that we are gathering, we've gathered the broad data. Now, the urgency is to dive deep into that. And anecdotal evidence suggests to us that we need to focus more on some of these rural settings, some of these vulnerable settings. And then we swing right back to if we do our role well as a central bank, economic prosperity is number one. When the country is doing well, then everybody rises. So, you know, it's around the Spoken like a true champion, don't you think? <laughs> so thank you very much for that. And, and I think, you know, just hearing a central banker talk and try to understand social norms, to inform the policies that you make is really quite encouraging for me as we look forward to what is to come. And before I end the panel, I will ask um, DG Elsie to for the last question for this panel is, you know, being where you are, sitting where you are, and also in the AFI um, group, what do you see for this women's financial inclusion? What is the future look, let's say, in the next five years? What do you expect to see? And I hope that's the same from what you also hope to see the next five years. Thank you so much. Um, we definitely, in five years, want to see that the gap, the gender gap in access to finance uh, has shrunk even further. Um, great that it has dropped. We want to see it shrink. Um, what we recognize is that in every part of the network, more women are getting access to finance, which is great. So we want to see more of that. We want more action on that. Um, data is going to be critical. And we want to see every member of the network actually implement sex disaggregated data. It is not easy. You've heard some of the challenges, but it's got to be done. So we need to recognize where the challenges are and what support is needed to help every member country do it. Data is king. Data is important not only for regulators and policymakers. It is important for the entire ecosystem, if you think of Helen's egg, um, to really engage broadly. Um, and it's also important for the providers of financial services to themselves understand um, how to design and offer services and products better. Um, so that's number one. We also want to see, lastly, um, that we're making traction on women in leadership, not only in policy and regulation, um, but also in the provision of financial services. Um, as one of us uh, at the breakfast said yesterday, uh, quoting... Madame Christine Lagarde, if there had been a layman sisters, the, the, uh, the global financial crisis may never have happened. <laughs> and the world would have been the better for it. Women are responsible and good at managing credit um, and are good when they're given opportunities to lead. Uh, and we believe that women in leadership will go a long way in promoting gender inclusive finance it may be like that in, like in Samoa, we may have more women than men getting access to credit, but that would be nice for a change. Uh, but, but really, it's gender-inclusive finance. What we don't want to see are gaps and inequity. So more of that. And um, just lastly, the, the, point, the key point is resilience, financial resilience. So account opening is only the first step. But we want to see that across the value chain, a woman has access to finance and in various forms, product services that allows her to start to sustain and grow a business uh, and to make the life transforming changes that are needed. Um, and so really um, all society approach, all hands on deck. And I believe that AFI is poised to support the network in that regard going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would take that as all our collective goal to see in five years exactly the things that DGLC said and products that are responsive and effective for women beyond just access, but really what, they, what can help them towards positive outcomes to improve their financial health, their resilience, and really take advantage of economic opportunities. So let us collectively commit and champion that uh, five-year vision. Hopefully the mapping that Helen will make will inform us more as a network, um, you know, good practices uh, that we can share around the network. And I look forward to five years from now what we will see about women's financial inclusion. So thank you very much, dear panelists. Excellent intervention.
Thank you to our presenters earlier and to all of you for your kind attention. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Can we uh, give Pierre or Roman a big round of applause for uh, moderating that session? We'll excuse our panelists from, uh, from, from the stage, but uh, in a moment, we're going to have the AFI Gender Inclusive Finance Ambassadors Recognition Ceremony. That's coming up in uh, about two minutes. I just want to quickly remind you the evaluation, please, if we can get straight on that as well so we don't miss uh, your feedback. You just need to add... Of course, um, this uh, plenary session number three for uh, your evaluation. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. We'll now move on to the AFI Gender Inclusive Finance Ambassadors Recognition Ceremony. And uh, for this, I'd like to invite back up on stage the Second Deputy Governor, Bank of Ghana, Elsie uh, Awadzi, and I'll also hand the microphone over to um, Helen. Walby, the Head Gender Inclusive Finance uh, for uh, AFI, to come and lead us with this presentation. Again, let me remind you all, please don't forget, we'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you so much. And I would just like to uh, thank all the panelists for their excellent interventions. In 2019, we had our first Gender Inclusive Finance Ambassadors Recognition Ceremony. And we hope to have a highly exciting program of in-person engagements and regional activities in the months going ahead. And unfortunately, the pandemic hit. And so our ambassadors, like many of the rest of us, were grounded. But now we are ready to appoint a new cohort of ambassadors who have all been able to meet the criteria to be recognized for their gender inclusive finance work since we last met in Kigali. Also, under the guidance of our very active gender inclusive finance committee, we will have an exciting program of events and activities coming up in the coming year so that all of the institutions who have been recognized for their work today will have plenty of activities to keep them busy. We know that many of you have some sessions coming up and we had to start late today, so we're going to go through this ceremony as quickly as possible. I will ask that if you are going to be recognized as an institution, please come up to the stage, collect your certificate and wait on the stage and then we will have a photograph when we have everybody available. So I will call the institutions one by one. If you can come to the stage as quickly as possible, and that will be much appreciated. So, the first institution who has been recognized as a Gender Inclusive Finance Ambassador Institution this year is Banco Central de Reserve del Salvador. Come onto the stage and collect your certificate. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, center stage. Hey, center stage with Elsie. The second institution we would like to recognize is Banco Central de Saint Tome et Principe. Please come to the stage. The third institution that we would like to recognize as a gender inclusive finance ambassador institution is Banco Central de Paraguay. Please come to the stage. The next institution we would like to recognize is Banco Nacional de Angola. The next institution we would like to recognize is Banco Central in Filipinas. There's a big cheer going up from that delegation. <laughs> The 
The next institution that we would like to recognize is Bank Al Maghrib. The next institution that we would like to recognize is Bank of Uganda. We really are having ambassadors from across the network. This is absolutely wonderful to see. The next institution that we would like to recognize is Bank de la Republic de Burundi. The next institution we would like to recognize is the Central Bank of Eswatini. And where would a ceremony be if we weren't to also recognize our hosts? The new Gender Inclusive Ambassador Institution of the Central Bank of Jordan. The next institution is the Central Bank of Nigeria. There's a big cheer there from a lot of our African brothers and sisters. The next institution is the Commission Nacional de Bancos y Seguras de Honduras. I'm sorry, I'm not a Spanish speaker if I mangled that up. <laughs> And coming back to the Arab region, the next institution is the Palestine Monetary Authority. We're staying with another one of our small island states, the Reserve Bank of Fiji. There, Fiji. <laughs> Our next institution for recognition is the Reserve Bank of Malawi. And not only are we banking on equality, but we're also banking on being a gender inclusive finance ambassador, the State Bank of Pakistan. And the next in person is Superintendencia de la Economía Popular y Solidaridad de Ecuador. We also have the Royal Monetary Authority of Bhutan. Unfortunately, their delegation has not been able to join us in person at the GPF, but we would like to give them a round of applause anyway so we can send their certificate on. These are your new Gender Inclusive Finance Ambassador Institutions for 2022. Please give them a large round of applause and show your appreciation for their success. Yes, join them.
Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you so much, Helen, and congratulations to all the ambassadors. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll move straight into our final session for today, which is the technical breakout sessions. And I know we're slightly over time, so we'll get through this very quickly. The technical breakout uh, for the first one, DFS for Health, Role of Financial Regulations in Healthcare Access. And uh, that is here at the Sacrament Ballroom. Technical breakout two, innovative finance, accelerating MSMEs, access to finance, a regulatory perspective with Thomas Rann. That is in the Dillman Hall. Technical breakout session three, the final one, is the financial inclusion of forcibly displaced persons with um, Nomsembo Hadebi, the uh, CEO of uh, Center for Financial Inclusion, Ministry of Finance of uh, Eswatini, and that is in the Gilgamesh Hall. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to now make your way to the respective breakout sessions that you wish to attend. If you'd like to stay here, Again, we have the DFS for Health, Role of Financial Regulations in Healthcare Access. We invite you to make your way to the respective uh, breakout sessions. We'll hand over the uh, programs to the um, moderators for each of the sessions and the presenters. Ladies and gentlemen, again, we invite you to make your way to the respective breakout sessions. We'll commence with this session within the next five minutes. We invite you to, um, to take up the allocated seats in the front so you can interact better with uh, the panelists during this session. We have a presenter, and following that theme setting, we'll then move straight into the panel discussion.
that easier for our speakers. Thank you all very much for your, your cooperation. Can I ask that we take our seats, please? Thank you very much. I believe that the other sessions are about to start, so for those of you who'd like to move to the other technical breakout sessions, please do so now. For this session, I'd like to invite first to come up and really set the theme before we move to the panel. Um, we have the governor of the Banco Central de, de Timor-Leste. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, put our hands together for uh, Abrao de Vasconcelos. Good afternoon. Uh, I have been asked uh, to do an intervention of five minutes, so I'll try my best uh, um, um, to deliver in five uh, minutes. What I would like to do is that I will highlight a few points um, on the DFS development and then share some of our experience uh, on how we started the DFS journey and then uh, pose a couple of questions for the uh, for us uh, to discuss. But before I uh, continue with my intervention, I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, Central Bank of Jordan uh, for hosting us here and for the very warm and gracious welcome extended to us. I also would like to congratulate the AFI Management Unit for the excellent organization of the AGM and GPF, as usual. Um, so, uh, over the past 10 years, we have witnessed a significant transformation in the financial sector, particularly the way financial services are delivered, the deployment of new technology, invention of new platforms or systems, the introduction of various innovative products, etc. This transformation has forced many central banks and supervisory authorities to adapt to these changes. Some of us were able to deal with the change quickly, while others were not. This includes Bank Central Timor Leste. We started our DFA, uh, DFS journey back in 2013. Um, at that time, we conducted a review into our financial sector and came up with the conclusion that the central bank has to take over the development of our um, national payment system. For your information, uh, Timor-Leste uh, financial sector composed mainly banks and insurance company. We have uh, smaller uh, MFIs and MTOs. But the main, uh, the, the, the principal sector is uh, the banking sector. And all of the banks are branches of foreign bank except one uh, state-owned bank and two MFIs. Uh, long story short, in less than five years, we were able to introduce uh, two, three critical payment systems. The, the wholesale payment system, RTGS, the automated clearinghouse, and a national card and mobile switch. We were able to achieve this, uh, and also we were able to integrate the entire system, commercial banks and the fintech companies that we introduced um, uh, late in 2018. So we thought that the, the journey is getting close to end. In fact, this is far from truth. As all of us we are witnessing, yesterday we just um, agreed to update the social accord. And this is something that uh, if we note, 
we now start having other um, uh, issues getting into the um, the the plate. CBDC is one of the issues. So this is something that uh, for all central banks, particularly those that uh, central banks that and supervisor authorities that we have um, um, limited resources, uh, AFI provide an excellent platform for us to exchange and learn, exchange experience and learn from each other. To conclude, those innovation in systems and product deployments of new technology can only become meaningful to those in the bottom of the pyramid if supported by key infrastructure as highlighted in documents published by AFI. Just to mention a few here, interoperability of platforms, uh, um, development of agent network, consumer empowerment and protection, supportive KYC regime, etc. I'd like to share with you uh, uh, two of these um, uh, key infrastructure, interoperability of platforms. In 2021, uh, we completed the, uh, the, the, we integrate the all banks in Timor-Leste and also uh, the fintech companies. So now people can move their money from bank account to wallet account, uh, vice versa. Uh, this uh, give a tremendous benefits to those particularly in the rural areas and those um, uh, that receive regular payments from the government like elderly, um, the support for mothers, um, they have been benefit uh, with this um, uh, development. Second that I would like to share a little bit is that the agent network. Uh, in 2019, we introduced uh, a program we call Digital Village. This is to expose population in the rural areas into the um, uh, digital financial product. And one thing that that time we learned from our uh, experience is that we did not put attention on the, the agent network. So we focused more on how to promote, how to encourage uh, fintech companies and banks to expand their uh, network in the um, rural areas. Uh, then after one year, we learned that this is something that we have to change. And last year, uh, we, Central Bank will lead the process of um, do a national-wide uh, promotion of getting agent everywhere. Uh, by the way, the agent that I'm referring to here, the agent of fintech companies, because they are the one who uh, easily uh, deploy their agent in the rural areas. Just to share a little bit, those population features particularly that work in the remote areas, they are now, they don't need to travel to the capital of municipal to get their salary. They move their money from their bank account to their wallet account and then walk to agent next door and get their money. And this um, uh, almost reach to the entire territory of Timor-Leste. So DFS will contribute significantly to healthcare access if, um, as I mentioned a few points before, if uh, supported by those key infrastructure. Before I conclude, I would like to pose two questions for uh, the panelists uh, to, to, to discuss. And probably we will not get the answer uh, now, but this is something that I believe uh, will be very important for us to look in the future. First is that, is there a regulatory space for payment service provider to offer comprehensive basic financial services, such as saving, health-related insurance payments, etc.? Second, how digital financial services specific, specifically central bank digital currency could help advancing the healthcare need? With that, I conclude my intervention. Thank you. It's just eight minutes. Please, can we uh, thank uh, Governor Vesconcelos again, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, setting our theme. I'd like to now invite the moderator for the session, Ms. Candy Ngula, 
the Deputy Director, Bank of Namibia, where she is involved in conducting research on trending and complex topics affecting the digital payments ecosystem and producing regulatory um, tools that have direct impact on the development of digital financial services ecosystem in Namibia. Candy also is the newly elected chair of AFI's uh, Digital Financial Services Working Group. Uh, so please join me in giving a round of applause for Candy. The floor is yours, Candy. Please come forward. Let's welcome her, and she, in turn, will welcome our panel members. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, fellow regulators, and fellow policymakers. Uh, associates and colleagues, I'd first like to thank the FE Management Unit for entrusting myself as well as the speakers today to tackle this very important topic. So we're very humbled and honored to be sharing our insights as well as our knowledge when it comes to digital financial services in the context of healthcare access. So thank you very much for joining us for this discussion. The way we'll run this session is We've just had a theme setting from um, the governor. And what we do now is we'll have the, an overview presentation from one of the speakers. And this presentation will outline key findings and trends um, and analysis outcomes based on a report that AFI as well as um, Access Health International worked on over the past couple of years. So one of our speakers will conduct that presentation and just give us an overview of that study. We will then get into the panel discussion. Uh, we have amazing speakers, and from their profiles, as I'll read to you shortly, you'll see that we have a very good blend of knowledge and skills from individuals cutting across public and private sector that will highlight in a very pragmatic way, hopefully, how regulation, financial inclusion, um, technology interlinkages with healthcare. We will also provide you with the opportunity to ask questions. I know this is the graveyard shift um, and everybody must be tired, but I'd like to ask for your participation when the time comes so that we can engage the speakers uh, through a Q&A. And lastly, we will also allow you to do an evaluation of the session as well. So. When the time comes, please do partake in the survey. We'd greatly appreciate your feedback. So to start off, I'd like to call each speaker to the stage, and you can walk onto the stage as I read your name. Firstly, I'd like to introduce Adrian Medenhall, who's the Global Business Development Lead for Access Health International. So, So Access Health International is a non-profit think tank, advisory group and knowledge and implementation partner to governments and the private sector, and it's dedicated to improving access to high quality, affordable healthcare in, in, across all income levels and in low, middle and high income countries. Um, it advises national and regional governments and the private sector on the design and management of healthcare finance and delivery systems. Speaking to Adrian yesterday, just from the conversation, I could tell that she's deeply, deeply passionate about health and making sure that um, health care should really be a right, a civil right to everybody. So we have the right person for this job today. The next individual is the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Sierra Leone. That's Sheikh Yaye Sase. So if I can just ask you, one of the things we've learned in Toastmasters, and I always say this, we clap until they reach their destination, so. Thank you. Wonderful, so just a little insight into his experience. He has tremendous experience in the financial sector management and is also an accomplished professional in the banking sector. Sheikh Yaye Sese, as the Deputy Governor, is also responsible for and oversees financial inclusion, financial integrity, and financial stability. He's also played a very pivotal role and has been the driving force behind the development of Sierra Leone's National Financial Inclusion Strategy 
for 2022 to 2026. He is a loving husband and a dedicated father to four children. That's what I found in your profile. So it makes sense as to why you would also take this topic very, very seriously because we all have loved ones and health is important to them. Sharif Lokman, Sub-Governor of Financial Inclusion and Sustainability of the Central Bank of Egypt. Mr. Sharif Lokman is responsible for financial inclusion for individuals as well as MSMEs in addition to sustainable development and financial literacy. While he is the sub-governor of the central bank, he's also a very seasoned banker with extensive experience in the banking sector spanning over 26 years, during which he held a, a number of leading positions, setting valuable imprints of the banking sector through his accomplishments accomplishments cutting across sales, retail, um, branch management, and so forth. So a very good um, speaker to have on the team today as well. And last but not least, we have Wangechi Kanjama. Wangechi is the CFO of Mpesa Africa, Safaricom and Vodacom Group. Her career spans over many years in the disciplines of business planning and forecasting, wholesale and roaming, business partnerships and performance management. From her profile and what I've picked up from what people said about her on LinkedIn, she's known to challenge convention and she tries to do things in a different way whenever there's a new tide. She's also known to have an impeachable approach to resolving issues, which is something that we can certainly look forward to in this discussion today as well, as we unpack this crucial topic. So ladies and gentlemen, these are our speakers for this panel on DFS, on healthcare access. And just to get us into it, um, in 2018, the World Bank and the World Health Organization estimated that healthcare expenses pushes nearly 100 million people into poverty every single year. For, the most of, for most of the world, financial access strongly determines healthcare access. The link between financial health and physical health is a key driver behind the worldwide commitment to universal health coverage, UCI. And the central aim of UC, UHC, sorry, the central aim of UHC is to ensure that all people have access to healthcare, act, to healthcare services when and where they need it the most. Financial inclusion, therefore, really does have a complementary role to reinforcing UHC goals. And we've also seen how AFI member countries have showcased in various ways how DFS can be leveraged in healthcare access through different use cases pertaining to mobile money, banking, credit, and so forth. So before we get into the discussion, I'd like to ask Adrian, who will then do a very, very short presentation um, around the study that they did with AFI, and just to outline some of the key outcomes from that study. Adrian, the floor is yours. Thank you, and I will try to be brief. As um, mentioned, I know this is the last session of the day, so thank you all for being here. Um, as mentioned, we, Access Health, conducted a study with Afi last year on looking at a global landscape of what are the DFS for health models that we're seeing around the world in five particular regions, Latin America, Africa, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. So we conducted this mapping exercise to see what are the models that are out there? What can we learn from these models? And what are the role of regulators in enabling these models to exist and thrive? So as Candy mentioned, universal health coverage. Um, in 2019, heads of state from around the world recommitted to UHC, and particularly the goal to achieve UHC by 2030. That goal was very ambitious in 2019 and is even more so now with COVID as COVID has set back many countries on their UHC trajectories. And so we're now at a point where even fewer people have access to essential health services, and particularly the ability to pay for and access the care that they need 
when they need it. Um, unfortunately, we've lost a number of healthcare workers during COVID-19 as well. So there, when we talk about the application of digital financial services, or even broader than that, a financial inclusion approach to healthcare, we are not looking at only how do we pay for it, but we also have to take that step back and look at how do we support healthcare systems through these innovative approaches. So here's the three questions that we were trying to answer through the report. Again, what are the models that are out there and how are they impacting both access to health and financial access? What are the regulatory environment and what are the actions that regulators can take in order to remove some of these barriers and to play an active role in creating these models as well. So the models that we're looking at specifically within this report, and I have to mention that, or as mentioned, the that broader ecosystem around DFS for Health um, is maybe even broader than these, but the, the five that we looked at were specifically credit and lending. When we talk about credit and lending for healthcare, we're really talking about how do we create ethical, lending options for people, as we know that many people, when they have that unexpected health event that costs a lot of money, they might sell asset gener or, um, income generating assets, they might borrow from family and friends, they might go to loan sharks, or they might go to an established lender that's going to charge a really high interest rate. And we don't want people going into unbearable amounts of debt in order to pay for necessary health care. Um, payments, of course, which underlies all of these models, um, but we see that even in and of itself, that digital that just digital payments were able to help people um, pay for telehealth services, buy products, healthcare products, get medicines during COVID, but also act as almost that foundational layer to the more innovative DFS for health models. Um, savings as well, having digital health savings accounts or digital wallets enables people not only to put aside money for anticipated healthcare costs or to pay recurring healthcare costs, it also acts as an aggregator for funds that are coming in from different sources. So whether that is the insurer, donor funding, the out-of-pocket payments, remittances as well, while remittances are a separate category, they do have, um, you know, they can be combined in that health wallet. So from the patient perspective, they're making one payment, despite the fact that the funds are coming in from multiple places. And then of course, InsurTech as well. So the, and InsurTech runs the gamut from, um, you know, the platforms that allow people to shop for and purchase insurance all the way through to claims and reimbursement. So we found in our study that InsurTech was the largest um, that we or we found the most InsurTech uh, models out there, um, followed by the e-payments, of course, um, and then the the crowdfunding as well, and lastly savings. I'm just going to go through these quickly. What we do know is that during a crisis, whether this is a natural disaster or a pandemic or other crises as well, if DFS um, has a positive impact on people's health and allows us to, it's one of the tools that are helpful in getting people the healthcare services and products they need immediately, rather than waiting for different programs to, to roll out or to move cash to where it needs to be. So what are the role of regulators? This intersection between DFS and healthcare is really early on. We're at a point of, we don't have established best practices. We have emerging best practices. We have promising practices. We have things that look good. And what we really want to find out, we're in this opportunity zone right now of being able to learn from the other models that exist. So the government can play that active role of facilitating that knowledge sharing and awareness between different partners um, and different, and with communities and with patients directly as well. And then second, they can create these innovation hubs. So whether that is a sandbox or innovation challenges, um, et cetera, is that they can actively work with the, the private sector and be that steward for innovation and put those, those parameters around the fact and essentially have that call to action of saying, we want private sector innovation in this particular area. And there is an opportunity to partner with governments, to partner with UHC programs um, for those, those models that are successful. 
And then third is actively co-creating these models. So the government has an opportunity to say, we want to co-create with the private sector. This, these are the types of models that we think either complement or are needed within our national insurance agendas. And we want to invest in, co-create them, and roll them out as well. So this is where I'm going to conclude. I hope I was done within the five minutes. And I look forward to the discussion ahead. Thank you very much for that very concise presentation, Adrian. Um, very useful insights indeed, and it's good to see the work that um, Adrian and the team are doing to advance healthcare access. Um, so I will ask all the panel members a, a single question to get us into the discussion. And to each and every one of you, I'll ask um, a specific question and you can answer from your vantage point. We have the, this question was sort of touched on by Adrian in her presentation, but we do have the policy makers that will touch on it from a specific vantage point and we have the private sector company who will also touch on it from a specific vantage point. So the question is, between central banks and innovators, how can the two advance safe and secure digitally enabled health financing from your perspective? And we can start with Wangenji. Thank you. Um, so we have a very real example, and I'll use Kenya, because um, within the Kenyan framework, what we have is a very strong partner ecosystem.